Okay, so let's see. It should be live. Oh, we are live. Okay, cool. Yay. Okay, if I can just share this. All right, so I'm going to tag everybody below. Okay, hello everybody. I see people watching. Okay, perfect. We got people coming in. All right, family, just uh, bear with. <laughs> oh man, sometimes I don't like saying that word because people just have taken it so far. But just bear with us for a second, family. We're letting everybody get on, sharing this so that people can see we are live. Okay, let's see. There we go. Boom. All right, peace, brother. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. 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 All right, I just wanted to make sure everybody could hear. Okay, so we got this shared, everything. We'll be getting started in just a few. I'm excited for this video too. I'm, I've been, I've been wanting to do this for years. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm just tagging everybody now in on Facebook, so then you guys can just go share that. Okay. Bet. All right. I'll tag y'all so that shit. Wrong, you. Wrong comment section. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, can everybody see the chat? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. I can see it. All right. So we got six people on. All right, guys. We're gonna be getting started in like uh, two or three more. Well, about five more minutes. We're just purposing to let everybody share. Let everybody get on. Get you some water. Get a little snack if you need it. Pull up my notes. So this is what I need to tell you. Okay. Um if you can't oh peace sis, how are you? All right. Let me mute my phone. All right, can we be heard? Everybody in the chat, can y'all just put a one in the chat if we if you can hear? Just want to make sure the audio is good for everybody. Yay. All right, now don't be shy. I see y'all. Okay, three more minutes and we're gonna get started.
Hey, Shalom, Mami, how are you? Shout out to everybody that typed that text me so I could shoot you out a text that we're live. I really appreciate y'all. All right, so can everybody at least unmute yourselves and say something just so everybody can hear? Let me sure we can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, you can be heard. Can you hear me? Yes, you can be heard. Um, cock -a -doo -doo -doo. I can hear you too. And what about me? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Before we get started too, um, Mids, just to let you know, I will, since you are the elder, I will be asking you for permission to start the show. So after you give that permission, then we'll go ahead and start. Oh, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guest and I, and I respect your consideration of me, um, but I, I respect you as a professional. Thank and you, I know that, you know, when you're ready to go, we'll be ready to go. Yes, sir. I appreciate that. That's your blessing. That's all I needed. Thank you. Okay, everything has been sent out and we are gonna go ahead and get this thing rolling. Hey, Terrence, how are you? Okay, so let me just check that. Okay, no worries. All right, so man, you guys, today, this live, this, this show is a game changer. It was a game changer for me and I know it will be a game changer for you all as well. Uh, I just want to say we already had the blessing of the elders. Let us go ahead and get started, guys. One thing I just want to say, please be polite in the comments, because if you act up, you will get the full wrath. OK, so please don't do that because we are all here to learn today. All right. OK, so let's get started today. We are going to be talking about Hebrew literacy. Right. Uh, why that's so important and the difference between what you're reading in the translations, the many translations, not just K uh, KJV, even though we will be using um, those comparisons. However, this is to show the many, just the, the, the broad difference between your translations and what the actual Hebrew text says. And this is very important that people understand this. So today we'll be going over uh, four topics, all right? And um, that first topic, will be the Tower of Babel versus the Gate of God. All right, we'll also be speaking about God versus gods, who is yod heh -Wow -He. uh, We'll also be speaking about, does the Bible speak about Deuteronomy being the uh, transatlantic slave trade? And then also, do we see that there is a Satan or devil character in the Torah, the Tanakh, all right, the Hebrew Bible? So these will be our topics that we'll discuss, and this is what we'll be going in on today. Uh, be mindful that you are speaking with um, some brothers who are extremely competent in their skill. So please be respectful. Uh, number two, also be mindful that uh, we will be giving the, well, each one of the panelists will be given their verses as well as the parsing. So they will break down the Hebrew and give the translation as well. So we'll be able to directly see the difference between the translation and the Hebrew text. Okay, so this is how we'll carry out the show. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. Disclaimer, disclaimer. This show is not to change anybody's religious or spiritual view. This show is not to talk down on anybody and their view. This is not to attack anybody and their current view. You are more than welcome, that is your right. This show is strictly to help open your eyes to see how some people are lying about knowing Hebrew, some of these teachers, and they don't know any Hebrew, to open your eyes to see the, the concepts that you're holding as being, uh, some of these concepts that you're holding as, as, as being present in the Hebrew Bible are not there, okay? And uh, we're going to go ahead and get right to it. So let's introduce the panel that we have. 
Whew, man, we're going to start out with your brother, Miss. Miss, if you don't mind just introducing yourself and a little bit of your background, please. Um, all right. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. So um, I guess I've been called a, a great many things by a great many civilizations, but um, um, you know, I, I like to kind of call myself um, the great divine Lex. Um, you know, um, you know, but you know, for those that don't know me as divine Lex, um, um, I'm Medjid, and um, yeah, it's not, not. I mean, I'm a. Uh, let me see. I'm an old guy. I'm a senior citizen. Um, let me see what else. I'm an Edomite. Um, well, I'm half Edomite, half Amorite. Um, what else? No, let me behave. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know. Just straight to the point. Um, I'm a regular kind of fellow. I have a sincere disdain for people um, and institutions um, that look to misappropriate, misuse um, literature for the purposes of exploiting people. Um, to oppress people, to abuse people. Um, and so that's pretty much what it is. Um, for about a decade, I've um, waged asymmetrical warfare on various organizations that have proliferated misinformation and have set out to um, undermine uh, community efforts to thrive in this institutional impoverishment. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it in a nutshell. Okay. All right, thank you for that. And next, let's go with Ifa Bukola. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Um, I go by the given name Ifa Bukola uh, Orumila. I am an um, I'm an Ifa devotee. Uh, that's where the name comes from, the Ifa tradition. However, um, I am a student of Semitic linguistics, uh, more specifically Biblical Hebrew and Arabic, uh, Quranic Arabic. Um, I have been doing this for a few years now. Um, you know, my, my trade by day is that of a farmer. So I pretty much uh, I wrestle with animals and dirt all day. So, <laughs> um, but my purpose in getting into Semitic linguistics was to uh, just to, you know, piggyback off of what Miss was saying, mm -hmm. um, to pretty much shed light on what the texts in question are actually saying versus what uh, religious institutions, however um, large or minuscule. You know, My purpose in getting into Semitic linguistics was to. Uh, Oh, snap. I can hear an echo. I thought somebody else was talking. But uh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> but no, my purpose is to uh, basically help to shed light on issues that are uh, proposed and posited by specific groups um, in, a, in, in, in an attempt to at least help people understand that they may or may not be given the whole truth of the matter. And, you know, just to try and help spread the understanding that having a proficiency in the languages of attestation of whatever, you know, uh, manual or, or book you ascribe to is of utmost importance so that you may be able to discern the real from the fake. Um, too many people are being ostracized, uh, marginalized, and straight up mistreated uh, because of what they think is being said in a book that is actually not conveying that particular thought at all. Right. And so it's part of my uh, mission, if you will, to help lighten that load, you know, and to help spread the um, spread the uh, the need for literacy, if you will. So yeah, that's me. Uh, just a simple form hand, you know, um, that likes to read uh, Semitic linguistic, uh, that likes to read things of a Semitic linguistic nature. That's it. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you for that. We appreciate you. All right, uh, JD, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit uh, about you and what qualifies you uh, for you know, th this uh, panel? 
All right. Uh, I'm usually known as JG Pill. I think that's what a lot of people know me as in with um, the Hebrew community. I've been studying with MITS uh, probably like eight years, eight or nine years, something like that. I got into it because I wanted to be able to read the original language mm -hmm. instead of translations. Yes. As I began studying, I learned that was a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, from when I was reading from the KJV, you know, and learned all the grammatical rules, you know, within the Hebrew language itself. So I started with Hebrew, then started learning some Ugaritic and some Akkadian. So those are the you know three Semitic languages you know, that interest me and that I study. Uh, and that's pretty much it. All right. All right. And then, yo, if you can go. Yo, um, I um, I go by the screen name Yo Kanabi Israel. Um, everybody knows me as JJ, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm I'm having some extreme technical difficulties, so forgive me if I seem distracted. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I got into this uh, learning this because um, I knew that there was a that there was something more um, when reading, you know, reading the um. Christian translations as well as reading the Jewish translations of the um, Hebrew Tanakh. Um, there were things that stood out that did not make sense in English. Um, and it seemed like everyone, you know, when I asked questions, no one seemed to be able to give solid answers. Um, the answers were based on opinions. They weren't based on scholarship. They weren't based on anything that they had um, been able to, you know, solidify. So I knew that at that point it was time to study, you know, the book and its languages of attestation, which are biblical Hebrew and Aramaic, um, as well as um, dabbled in uh, Ugaritic as well, um, in order to, you know, understand the historical backdrop of the literature um, and to understand the culture of the people versus trying to look at it through a micro, you know, through a microscope and seeing just Israel. Um, I wanted to be able to look at um, Israel through the bigger picture um, of the ancient Near East. Uh, with his neighbors, um, whether they be friends or foes, and to be able to understand it from their perspective. Um, right. Because the Bible only gives one perspective um, when reading it in English. It seems like it only speaks about the Israelites and saying that, you know, the Girgashites and, you know, the Amalite, Am um, Amalekites and Edomites and everything with them saying that they're evil, but that's only one side of the story. <laughs> so I wanted to know what the other side was. So um, now I make it a point um, that when I see a lie, um, I, I will never try to take anyone's religion um, or belief. But when those things are tried to, when they try to voice those things as facts um, and they're incorrect, um, you know, from a factual standpoint, um, you know, I try, I make it my business to call those things out so that other people won't be poisoned. It's not to um, hurt people, but it's to help people that, that may be watching. So, um, simple guy, nothing really special other than that so um i'm still working on these technical issues so um please bear with me <laughs> of course no worries no worries all right and i appreciate everyone for introducing themselves and i wanted i wanted you all to just to hear uh their stories their background and their credentials because it's important that we do that oftentimes and i, I was i don't want to say victim because it was my own ignorance but i was also a victim of my own ignorance and followed other people um and what they said the Bible said, or the Torah said, that's not said. And I was really just reading translations. And, you know, I, I can say, okay, at some point when you're just learning and you're just beginning, fine. Okay. But there comes a dis, there comes a time when you just have to take that extra step and you got to go that extra mile because like these brothers, I, I too was like, I don't, I'm tired of everybody telling me what this is. I want to know what it says for myself, especially if I'm basing my soul, my life, on this and and how I live my life and you know I, it is very important that we can we have that competency because if we don't have that competency then it's like you're depending on everybody else and what they say and that's just that's not good enough for me so I'm glad that y'all could hear them uh, so you can see these are real people you know what I mean and they all took the necessary time because of their own search their own wanting to know what it actually says right. So I'm gonna open this question up to the panel briefly, guys. Why is it important? Why is Hebrew literacy important? And what's wrong with the translations? Anybody can go, it's, it's, it's open. I think um, we should 
let, let's let some um, before we get to me. Yes, sir. I would like to. Um, I, I don't know how honest people are willing to be. You know, uh, I'm sometimes I'm overly candid, and I've reached that that point in life where I don't care about being cool, so I can probably be more candid than most. Um, and so, you know, I think I'll try to go last, um, okay. but I, I do think there's some really some some gravitas in the the, the various stories that could come. So um, mm -hmm. I'll just save myself for last. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm 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 the youngest out of this group, so I guess I'll uh, take a stab at it. Um, well, if we take into consideration that various translations have a a motive, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I don't want to say a reputation, but they have a uh, an axe to grind, so to speak. Mm -hmm. These translations will reflect that, you know. So, for example. Um, Let's say, for example, you know, if there is a need to promote uh, monotheism or however, the, you know, whatever the case may be, then items that are grammatically plural will be presented as singular in their translation. Um, if there's a political agenda, you know, if, if there's a need to undermine particular contributions made from a specific ethnic group, then there will be verses that are translated as a means of doing just that, you know, maligning a particular ethnic group. Um, and if there is a desire or a political or social or social or sociopolitical motive to disenfranchise a particular gender, then there will be items that will be translated in light of that. So, um, as you go through the text and compare with these various translations, whatever they may be, whether it's New American Standard, um, New English Version, 1611 King James, or whatever have you, you'll find that there are disparities between what the text is actually saying versus what is being translated, depending on what acts that particular group that's doing the translating has to grind. Right, right. Yeah, and that, that's actually something that I was unaware of, obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in the beginning, because a lot of people have this idea that, oh, I'm reading the Bible and even on it, it's just an English translation. You know what I mean? It's just it's just an English translation. They just did the best they could, you know, and it's like, actually, no, that was motivated. And they, they made sure it gave a certain perspective for their own benefit. It wasn't a bunch of people who was just like, we want everybody to know what God says, you know? And I think a lot of people don't really see it that way or they don't know. And so they think that it is okay to just preach and teach from this translation, you know? And many people will take out one word and then they'll translate that one word and then put that back into the English translation. And it's just like, man, that it doesn't work like that. Like you can't just do that. So, um, it, what else? Does anybody have anything else they want to say before uh, Mitt speak? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Dwight, he, he pretty much wrapped it up, though. OK. So, uh, yeah, I think that's the consensus. OK. Sir, you're, you, you got the floor. If you want to say anything. All right, well. Um, if you, in all honesty, at a certain point, anybody with any remaining bit of humanity should be disgusted. I mean, beyond appalled. You know, we're, we're beyond being appalled at what's happening. Um, think about this. This is 2021, right? There, there are people that you know that remember the days of beepers and pay phones. There are people that you know that are alive right now that remember the days of card catalogs and having to have a library card to check out books, research books that you couldn't check out so you had to write notes. I mean, so think about all the technological advancements and all the avenues that are afforded this generation, right, as it relates to 
access to information, right. acquiring information. And there seems to be a complete dereliction of duty as it relates to seeking out viable substantive information. Okay. Um, and that's unfortunate, but what it, what is given rise to is this new brand of um, false teacher that commoditizes poverty and has figured out a way to create a customer base, a client base, based on how many people they can have access to that don't have adequate access to information. And if they did, they wouldn't know how to manage it. So they keep okay. them institutionally impoverished by feeding them, you know, doctrines that systematically undoes their desire to seek information like, oh, that's the white man's information. You don't need that. Oh, that's right. the white man's education. No, that's the white man's schools, their universities or whatever. And then what they'll do, they'll under the cover of darkness, go grab a book that they don't understand and then try to pawn this off as new information. Um, and, you know, and if it was just men doing men dirty, you know, they could just knuckle it up and work it out at right. the end of the day. Like, hey, you shy to me now, I got to beat you up. But unfortunately, these guys disproportionately are targeting women. Right. And right. the the impact is disastrous. We see disproportionately it is the women that are being targeted within these institutionally impoverished demographics. And mm -hmm. so then they get impregnated and they get strapped with this child, continuing the cycle of poverty and then subjecting the child to some of the most pathological elements that could be introduced to a nuclear environment, you right. know, affecting the child's development and how they're going to either become or not become a contributing member of society. And so you just can see it in real time happening. You look, look at how women are being treated, not by dudes in the street, but by dudes in the church. Exactly. Right? I mean, and, and so I'll call people by name. I'll call the Sakari crew out by name because they're a perfect example and they're relevant, mm -hmm. right? It's right. like, if you are a man of God you know, and you are following a set of rules that are written, right, for you to follow, then you would not be looking to exploit the weaker elements of the community. Exactly. And that's what it boils down to. And so for me, it's like, wow, you're, you're, you're abusing women in the name of God. That's no different than, uh, you know, a dude that throws back a couple and he just can't hold his liquor. So he beats his wife mm -hmm. every time he ties one on. We right. would say that is wrong. Right. But yeah. for some reason, no one is saying that the charlatans wheeling KJVs are wrong and are, and are abusers. They're abusers. They are. You know what I'm saying? And they're looking mm -hmm. to legitimize rape. They're yeah. looking to legitimize sexual assault. They're looking to legitimize aggravated assault. The, I mean, I could just a uh, list of things that they're looking to legitimize by putting the stamp of God on it. And that's not cool. Man, you know, I'm glad you even said that because um, you're right. A lot of people, that's something that, you know, a lot of people don't touch on is how much people are being manipulated into certain things and they're justifying these crazy concepts with with a translation you know what i mean and people believe it and people follow it because they don't know how to read the text for themselves and they're just everybody's just going off of this translation and just you know what the spirit told them and it's like well the spirit telling y'all a lot of stuff and you know what i mean like people people really are uh, uh they are vehicling their evil through these camps and teachings of these doctrines and these dogmas here 100 percent. yeah i'm just i don't know i'm just fed up you know um they've they've taken um it's gone beyond commoditizing mm -hmm. ignorance uh, they've now weaponized it right and so um now you have these fatherless children who are looking for acceptance, they're looking for significance, they're looking for security, and they've been institutionalized from day one. The minute that they got dumped off into public school, 
someone decided they were going to figure out a way to pipeline them from public school to prison. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the institution has been a part of their life for a very long time. And so when you look at the numbers, disproportionately the people that litter these camps are people that have been institutionalized and they've been victimized from day one. Yeah. Right. Because you're not going to find too many critically analytic people that remain in camps. Let's just be completely honest. True. People that understand how to cite sources and look up sources and vet sources are not going to stay in a camp (laughs) unless they're looking to make money off the people that don't know better. Right. Right. And and you're absolutely right. Uh, You know, it's and it's like people uh, people play off of the, oh, I changed my life around type of thing uh, to, to say that, you know, to kind of be like, oh, well, that was my old life. But then you see that they get into these camps, these circles, these congregations, and they're doing the same thing they were doing, you know, got them in trouble in the first place. And it's just, it's a lot of scheming, scamming, you know, and just wickedness, really, I would say, evilness, you know, whatever. It, it's terrible. So, um, you know, that just wanted to talk on that. What is, you know, why the, why we're doing this? Because people don't really see. And I saw every time you're conversing with someone in the comments, they're maintaining their position on whatever their concept is or, or whatnot. You find that they're always like, oh, well, you don't have the spirit. And that's why, you know, you can't read the text and you, you can, you can have the grammar and all that, but you don't have the spirit, you know? And it's just like, okay, well, how do you fight that you know and so that that's uh that's one reason why just so the audience knows this is another reason why we're doing this show so that you guys can see beyond all the emotional grabbing and all the tantrums that people throw online the reality is this is what the text says and then it don't say that you know so we're gonna go ahead and hop into these hop into these topics um we're going to start off with the brother JG, the Tower of Babel versus the Gate of God. And uh, he's going to give us the verse and we'll be able to pull that up and see. And then um, he'll go and work his working on that. So. All right. Um, it's Genesis 11 and 9. Okay. Let me see if I can share my, share my screen real quick. Uh, can you see it? Yes. All right. So I kind of forgot what was going on as far as like the doctrine and everything that's you know going about as far as like the Tower of the Tower of Babel or Babylon. And they say it's like confusion or something like that. Mm-hmm. So and then it says it's like Hebrew was the first language and that was the language that was being spoken until until it got scattered. So here I'm gonna do like a short a short presentation on PowerPoint to go through, you know, hit some key points real quick and get straight to it. And then if anybody want to add anything, again, you know, you're welcome to do so. Uh, so uh, was Hebrew the first language? This is important because was Hebrew spoken at the Tower of Babel or at Babylon or whatever. All right, so let's say class, classical ancient Hebrew is the 10th century BCE. Then let's say the oldest Semitic language that we have is like Old Akkadian. And it is attested mid third to end of third millennium. You know, so that is well over a thousand years, you know, older than the Hebrew language itself. Uh, so that pretty much goes straight, you know, goes directly, you know, straight to the point as far as like Hebrew definitely can't be the oldest language because we know when it was, you know, created, or we know when it was, you know, you know, when it showed up around the 10th century. These are the sources, you know, at the bottom. So Anybody can uh, go and check it out. That's where I got it from. All right, so here on this slide, the Tower of Babel versus the Gate of God, Genesis 11 and 9. Here we got the, the common misconception is that Babel means confusion because of how the sentence is structured in most English translations. It is a compound word, Baba and El, borrowed from older cognate languages. So as we see here, even, you know, Babel, you know, itself comes from an older language as a cognate. 
So Hebrew is not the oldest Semitic language, but we know that Akkadian is. So per many scholars, it comes from Babilu or Babili, right, which is Akkadian or Syrian, means the gate of God or gate of the gods, respectively. The word Balao means to confuse and confound in this particular verse and beyond a possible play on words, it should not be viewed as explaining the meaning of Babel as they have different roots and different meanings. Verse nine must be read in context with preceding verses to get a clear understanding. A tower is being built to reach the skies. Yahweh doesn't want the children of men to complete this task. He says, come let us go down and confound their language. It was at this point that they came down via, via the gate of God, hence the name being called Babel, gate of gods. In this source, you can read this from the Mesopotamian background of the Tower of Babel account and its implications. All right, so now, as we can see, we, uh, in this one says uh, Babilu and uh, Babilu. So this is like Akkadian language, so let's go to where it's actually attested. The oldest attestation of it. And so this is the Akkadian language. This is Akkadian grammar, which is a part of, and you can find this in the sources that I gave in the first slide. So you got the Akkadian genitive chain or construct chain. All right, so I say there is, however, a more common construction of expression, expressing a genitive relation, namely the simple juxtaposition of the governing and governed nouns, you knowing that order, such as such a construction is called a genitive chain. When it is used, the governing noun, i.e. the first noun in the chain, normally appears without any case ending. Uh, for example, uh, without the uh, U-M or the I-M or A-M. And thus, the same for all cases. As will be seen below, masculine, plural, and dual nouns do retain their case ending. Right, and so that is like the main part, because as I go to the next slide, you can follow along with me. All right, so the gate and God and Akkadian. So this is the dictionary, right, within the Akkadian grammar book. We have the word gate uh, on the left picture. And like in the middle of the, uh, the dictionary, you see gate, it's called Babel. Mm -hmm. And on the right picture, we have the word God. Uh, and like in the middle it says Elam. All right, and so when you add it, you know, like together within a construct, as you can see right here in the dictionary as well, Babylon is Babylon. Now that's the same thing that's mentioned you know, within that second slide I was talking about. So as looking at the word, so the grammatical breakdown of Babylon and Akkadian. So the word, as we look in the dictionary of Babylon is gate and construct, will lose the case ending you know, the U and the M being the governing noun, therefore it will look like, you know, my, all right, okay, the A, B. Elam, God, is a masculine singular genitive noun. If we add the two nouns together, it will look like the B, which is translated as gate of God. So this is Akkadian grammar that we're looking at, the old Semitic language. And then we can see how, as, um, you know, as we look at the, you know, the Hebrew Bible, you know, we can see, you know, from the older cognates where it came from. But then we look down at the last point. It says, however, if we change the case ending, like on, uh, for God, so the I am on Elim to just the I, then it would look like Bebili, which would be translated as gate of gods. So, so this is like how a kid in grammar works. And if you go back to slide two, you know, we can see right here, back, stunned at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, the misconception is Babel means confusion because how the sentence is structured in most English translation is a compound word and borrowed from older cognate languages, which is, shown, which is you know, the Akkadian. You know, as many kind of scholars say, from Babilo or Babili means the gate of God or the gate of God's respect. So this is how scholars, you know, even doing comparative studies, this is where they come from because, you know, they study of the Akkadian language, and this is just a basic, a basic breakdown, you know, of the grammar in and of itself. Uh, so, it, through evidence, I mean, 
clearly looking at older text. One second, brother. Your mic keeps going in and out. I don't know if that's just. Yeah, yeah. hello. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, so if we can, uh, so clearly looking at older languages, it is actually translated or understood as the gate of God. And that's how the Babylonians, or that's how people during that time period, especially would have recognized that. Um, so that's pretty much it for the- uh, So wait, so, you, so you're telling me though that it doesn't, it's not saying uh, <laughs> that somebody came down and confounded all the languages, um, the way everybody like to say that that is actually speaking about the gate of God. Yes, the gate of God. Um, How could you know, we even translate that as the other thing? I don't understand that. Yeah, I think they try to play on like the Hebrew word Balaam, which means mm. like to confuse and confound. That's why I showed this uh, this slide right here because you had scholars you know, talking about this, this subject in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but doing comparative studies. Looking at the comparative studies, you know, we can pretty much see see how it probably should be better understood right. you know, within the context. You know, looking at different verses, like from verse nine. So we can read it again. Verse nine it says, it "Must be written in context with preceding verses to get a clear understanding." A tower is being built to reach the skies. Yahweh doesn't want the church of men to complete this task. He says, "Come, let us go down and confer their language." It was at this point they came down via the gate of God, hence the name being called Babel. The gate of gods but then you can look up you know at the first paragraph and we can see uh you know where the actual name come from and what it actually means yeah so, that, that totally trumps the whole you know i've heard it several times uh by a few people saying how hebrew was the original language and then you know the angels came down confounded the language and now we got what 70 languages or whatever <laughs> like yeah, I mean, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It's like that's as Miss was talking about earlier. It's like back then when it came with this doctrine, you know, I mean, it could they didn't have you know smartphones or computers. They had to go to a library, catch a bus, and actually read the books. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, unless you pretty much enroll, but it's pretty you know. But it's like now, just do a quick Google search. All right, mm -hmm. see when was the Hebrew language tested? When is the oldest? And it's clearly all sources, all scholarly sources, and anybody that that are familiar with Semitic languages, you know, an ancient Near East will tell you that it's only 10th century BCE. So we have much older languages written in clay tablets, you know, that predates that. So Hebrew is more newer on the scene, you know. Yeah, and people are allowed to teach that because everybody just works in belief. And it's almost like a sin for you to actually research, even though it says show yourself approved, like, you know, or in the in the in the KJV translation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What they're reading, what they're reading, and what it actually says are two different things. And I hope everybody sees this, that it's not even talking about no Tower of Babel. And that's the problem, is that I've seen people give whole lectures on this. It's crazy. And it'd be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even talking about that. I mean, they, the people that are teaching, well, you know, the majority that I've that I've that I've witnessed, they're not really familiar with the Hebrew text, you know, with the Bible itself, the right. development of the Bible, and the ancient areas, you know, older languages. Mm -hmm. So they learn something with it. Click on the YouTube video, they will learn, and then they'll regurgitate the same information, you know, and they'll try to start their own you know, camp of teaching and have followers to try to sound deep. Mm -hmm. That's also, as Miss was saying, they were going to these different sources, but they don't understand these sources. Right. Those different scholarly sources because they're not trained. And so, if you ask, and but I mean, let I me mean, think about it though. We have people that says the King James Version is the, you know, is the the true word of God. I mean, mm -hmm. that statement in itself is ridiculous. But that's why you don't see people reading from the Hebrew text. They will make up a lie and say, well, then I can't read from the Hebrew text. Well, I read from the Hebrew text, then you won't understand. It's like, but we do it all the time. We, you can read it and parse it out and translate it. Mm -hmm. so actually yeah. teach people how to read it. Uh, but it's because they don't know, right? So, but they will speak with yeah. confidence and say, this is what it is, you know, and then it's something they never heard before. Mm -hmm. So then they'll just roll with it. Exactly. And, and you're right. That is the thing. You know, people always say, oh, well, you know, people... People do what they have, but it's like whenever you are a 
putting yourself in a position of a leader, then, you know, the bar is much higher than somebody who's just doing it for themselves, you know? And um, again, people are allowed to do this, like you said, because the other, everybody else doesn't have the literacy that they're not, they don't know. And then those people that, or I, I, they call it, I call it fake translates, right? Well, they'll take one word and then translate that one word. And then all of a sudden people see them as experts in Hebrew just because <laughs> they were able to train. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I, I mean, in congregations like that. And that's a good indication that they don't know. Because if they did, they would actually bring up the Hebrew text. I mean, like you can see, like everybody on this panel, usually when they're sharing information, they are reading directly from the Hebrew text and parsing it out. Like Mitzi mm -hmm. does it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, even when, even when, uh, like I, I look at something like let's say Ugaritic or Ugaritic or like Akkadian, something like that. We have to read from the text. When we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we read from the text. We don't use translations. Wow. You gotta take the time and. You know, and learn how to read, learn the grammar, and apply it. Uh, so yeah, so we really don't, you know, we don't like all, any translation that's out there. It holds no weight with us, and even in the scholarship world, I mean, that's mm -hmm. a joke. So, uh, yeah. So you, so if they, if you have a teacher or instructor, they're reading a from the a English translation, no matter what it is, and then they do one Hebrew word or try to show like a strong concordance of a single word and not reading from the text. Mm -hmm. Most likely, they're bullshitting, right? Yeah. They're not really. They don't know what they're talking about. Look, they get that blue letter Bible and then go to the translation, <laughs> and then go down. And even in the blue letter Bible, it'll give you the different stems, and they, they just every, everything is called stem. Just okay, we're going with the first one, just the first. Know. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't even know what a stem is. <laughs> I mean, they don't, they yeah, don't that's really true. Know. It's like they don't know. This is a call. This is a PL. I mean, they'll just say it. And then, like, <laughs> like, what does that mean? You know? yeah. I mean if, but if they really applied it, then, like I said, they would just read, they would just read from the text. But they don't. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if anybody else on the panel want to add anything, then yeah, please. Do so. it's open if anybody else want to say anything about it. Uh, real quick. Um, <clears throat> like I was listening to, I was listening to what you were saying, Jay, and um. You brought up the uh, the Akkadian and how uh, Babylon itself is, you know, an Akkadian loan word in Hebrew, right? So wouldn't the fact that there's an Akkadian loan word or it's borrowed from Akkadian already indicate that Hebrew couldn't be the first language if it had to borrow something from another one? <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, and it's, it becomes quite obvious because even like we don't. We really don't have to go as far back as Akkadian. You know, we can go to Ugaritic, which right. predates that by a couple of hundred years. Right? Right. And we can see long words from there. Um, so you can look at the uh, Akkadian text, look at, I mean, the uh, Ugaritic text, the grammar there, and then you can also see cognates. So it predates right. that. And so, like, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say so the whole mysterious thing about, you know, Hebrew being the, the special mystical language you know it's like no it's not <laughs> it's, it's really not <laughs> you know oh my so, god yeah go ahead all right so quick question uh, another then this is my last one it's gonna be the the nail in the coffin that is gonna be kind of ironic um all right so as you had stated uh akkadian and um you know babylonian if you will they predate biblical hebrew by a couple millennia right uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. And if that is the case and this word where, you know, they get the idea of, you know, the, the Tower of Babel from, if that language itself predates Hebrew by, I don't know, a couple millennia, and we notice, you know, in Semitic linguistics that um, if Akkadian is the oldest, then when we do look at Biblical Hebrew, when we do look at Ugaritic, when we do look at uh, um, Arabic, you know, uh, Hejazi or how, or how, whatever have you, or if we're looking at Gaz, or if we're looking at um, any of those Semitic languages that are younger than it, wouldn't it 
kind of be more logical to say that Akkadian was that language that they are trying to make oh. Hebrew out to be? <laughs> I mean, you, since you want to take it there, <laughs> that's you know, that you is, violence cool. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just I saying, you know, I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, but dramatically, all these, 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 these stems, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah, Akkadian I know. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, pretty much, yeah. I mean, to keep it simple, it's like, it just, I mean, that's just a, a great point. If the oldest Semitic language that we have, uh, you know, that's attested, you know, is Akkadian, then then other Semitic languages come after that. And then we can see cognates, right? We can see how these different words in the original languages, you know, how they, how it's cognates and how, you know, from Akkadian to like Ugaritic, Ugaritic, you say, um, you know, Hebrew. You also got like Arabic and some different words as well. I mean, you know. I right, well, yeah, I appreciate you answering that question, man. I was just, you know, I was curious. Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you kind of went out there a little bit at the end, but it's okay. Um, all right, so uh, were you were you done with your presentation, brother? I just want to be sure. Oh uh, yeah, I'm done. Okay, all right. That was that was excellent. Thank you so much. That was, man. I mean, like again, guys. This the whole point of this is to show you what the concept, the doctrine, the dogma, what everybody's saying versus what's actually there. It blew my mind when I realized that thing said the gate of God. You know, that's a whole nother little rabbit hole. <laughs> Uh, if you keep going on that, but um, it, it's it's amazing that it doesn't say that what we think it does, you know. And again, we're parroting this information that we're getting from other people who are they can't read it themselves, you know. And uh, we're all on Facebook in the comments warring against each other in ignorance, and it's unnecessary. So um, let's go to the second one. We're, the second one we're gonna bring up is um, let's see, God versus gods of the Bible. Who is your hey wow hey? This <laughs> is something that when I found when I when I saw this for myself, my own eyes, it really made me say, we are being lied to, and this shit is very evil at this point. Because people, you know, it was a whole, it was a huge thing, monotheism versus uh heathenism. It, it, it was a, it was a huge thing, right? And uh a lot of people got caught up in people in, in uh, clout chasing. You know, everybody clout chasing these quote unquote Hebrew teachers or whatnot, but they don't even know Hebrew. They don't even know what it really says. And there wouldn't be so much debating if people were actually literate in what is written and they could see for themselves. So let's go ahead and go into God versus gods of the Bible. So is there one God in the Bible or is there more? There are, there's definitely more. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you loud and clear. I'm hoping because I'm, I'm like really, I'm down bad over here. So I'm hoping that you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Right oh, now. that's love. Okay, because I'm working between the computer and my cell phone, so I'm, I'm up Perfect. twice. So good, good, good. Okay, no worries. All right. So, um, the topic is, um, pretty much God versus God, um, and who is Yahweh, um. So we're going to go through grammatically um, and kind of let, you know, grammar speak for itself. Um, I'm going to go through a few verses. Um, I'll read them. Um, I'm not going to take up a lot of time and parse um, entire verses, but um, I will parse. I will, you know, things that are important, I'm going to point out and, and explain grammatically. Yes. So, um, all right. So the first, the first screen I got up, and this was not how I planned to have this laid out. So you all please bear with me as I go through this, because this was not, you know, how I plan to do my presentation. But, um, okay, so we have the word L-O-I, um, Aleph, Lamed, Wow, Hey. Sometimes it's spelled just Aleph, Lamed, Hey. Um, this is a singular meaning God um, and is used in reference to the God of Israel throughout the Tanakh. So what we have here is we have a clear example of, you know, God being used in the singular form um, for the God of Israel, the national God of Israel. So we keep that in mind as we move forward. The next word being Elohim, Aleph, Lamed, Hey, Yod, Mem. Um, this is the plural form of Eloi, it adds the, um, the Yod, Mem, masculine, plural suffix. Uh, if we had the pointing up here, we would see a Kedit, Yod, Mem, 
our masculine plural suffix. It means God. Um, but it also um, is frequently used as a collective noun to show a singular body composed of multiple members. Uh, the examples I use were pantheon, consortium, council. Another way to look at a, um, at a uh, collective noun would be like the word family. Um, let's say you have a family is composed of, you know, four members. Um, it's a mother, a father, a son, and a daughter. Uh, that would be a collective noun. It's singular. The word itself is singular, but it's one body. So like one body um, that should be moving in one direction or geared toward uh, doing a particular service or particular thing. Um, we'll go to an example of this being used as a collective. So bear with me again. I'm going to have to figure out which one of these is. Not that one. Not that one. Was it this one? Nope. Not that one. <laughs> All right. So this is the Reshit, um, one verse one, Genesis one verse one. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha shamaim we et ha All right, so what we see here, first and foremost, um, this doesn't say, Bereshit does not say in the beginning. The reason that we know it doesn't is because it does not possess the phonology of the definite article, hey. Um, hey um, or ha means the. So that's not there. Um, if so we would have something more like ba hoshi. Um, we have be hoshi. So that's in a beginning or or yeah, in a beginning at a start, um, something like that. It's not at the beginning. Wow. Um, bra is a third person masculine singular call stem perfect verb meaning to mean fashion or made shape. Um, Elohim, you all can see my mouth moving, right? Yes, sir. Okay, Elohim. Uh, this was the word that we were talking about. Um, so we have a, one of the big controversies that we had was, um, this was uh, me and Dwight, we literally got death threat over this, it was crazy. Um, what we have is, we have a plural noun. Why do we know this is plural? Because it possesses this kitty, yo, nim, masculine plural suffix. So grammatically, this is plural. Um, but in Hebrew, just like with every other language, you have to have verb subject agreement. Bra, that fashion, this is a verb. This is singular. So how does this work together? How do we get a uh, verb subject agreement with bara, within bara Elohim? Right. The way that we get this is that this is a collective noun. Um, just like I was saying earlier, family would be a collective noun. This would be pantheon, consortium, um, a council of, sort, of sorts. It's multiple bodies there, but there's only one, you know, there's, but it's one unit. It's a single unit made up of multiple pieces, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, bara Elohim et um, is the, is the um, uh, definite object marker. marker. Hashamayim that means uh, the atmospheres or the skies. With et and we have um, the definite art the depth. Excuse me, direct object marker. <laughs> Again, I'm kind of I'm still kind of trying to catch up because I was so behind. So forgive me. It's okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so with et, so we'll say and ha avreza. So this is the earth. So in a, uh, so in a beginning or at a start, it fashioned what fashioned Elohim, the consortium, the pantheon fashioned, um, the skies, the heavens, and the earth. Um, so let's get back over here. So we can we see how this functions as a um, as a collective noun. It doesn't just have to be. Um, a plurality, like as, as, as you know, I guess you would say a true plural, because we have to get verb subject agreement. We mm -hmm. also see that in uh, the that sheet or Genesis one twenty six, uh, as far as the us that's in there, when we see um, you know, in English, I think it says something like, "Let us go down and make man or make humans in our likeness or something like that, in our resemblance." Mm -hmm. Um, we see it functioning there as well, you know, it's, it's like, you know, and it said, because oftentimes what people think is that it has to be he or she or, mm -hmm. you know, they um, mm -hmm. or them, and it doesn't have to be. It can also be it when it's referring to a singular, when it's referring to a singular entity. So we could say it, what is that it? It is the pantheon. Um, so we get yeah. that there as, as, as well. That's what the Yod, um, when we see like the Yod prefix, a lot of times they say he knows, not just he, you know, for an imperfect sense verb, um, it's not just he, it could also be it. Um, everything's not, because people hear, you know, masculine and feminine, Hebrew, you know, like Spanish, it uses, you know, the masculine and feminine, um, you know, for, for verbs and nouns, but it doesn't have to be, 
it, it's not a male female thing. It can also be it. If we were talking about a dog, we may say it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we were talking about a cup, we, we would say it. We wouldn't right. we, we wouldn't say he or she, but it may be you know labeled as you know something that is feminine or masculine, but it's not a male or a female. That's not what that means. Um, so well, you yeah, know, that, a lot that, of people like to go in with that majestic plural right there. Oh, uh, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> we are gonna get to that. We're gonna go beyond the majestic plural. We, we're gonna get to that. I'm trying to make sure I squeeze all this under 15 minutes. That's why I'm not far from everything. It's all, <laughs> so, it's all good. All right. So the next word we come to, um, matter of fact, let's go back up. I don't want to see that one for y'all yet. So the next one that we come to is um L. So L is the leader of the Canaanite. Was the leader of the Canaanite pantheon. He was the head of the pantheon. He was um, uh, 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 he was the man. <laughs> For all intents and purposes, he was the man. So, as leader of the Canaanite pantheon, and also later, it was used as a generic term for God. This wasn't pre-exilic Israel and post-exilic Israel are like, you know, two completely different things. After going into Babylon and coming out, versus them being there before, and we can actually see that in the text. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we can see this, you know, you have the Theophoric the element, meaning, you know, the name of a god, is found in the name Yisrael, um, which the name means El will prevail, indicating that at some point El was recognized as their chief deity early in their religion. So it wasn't, El wouldn't have, was not something that was foreign to them. The Hebrew language itself isn't something that was made up out of thin air. It was not created in a vacuum, um, so to speak. Matter of fact, it would be better to call it a dialect versus a language, especially when you compare mm. it to older languages in the area. Like when you look at Ugaritic, Ugaritic is a lot like, um, and I mean, it's just a whole lot like biblical Hebrew. Mm. Um, even though the, the word for God in Ugaritic is Iluma, um, you know, Elohim, they're, they're very similar, you know, other than say their ending. Um, the words themselves are very, very similar. So they knew who L was. Right. Um, that was not a foreign thought to them. They knew who the head of that pantheon was. If not, I can guarantee you, they would have never used this word because they would have never left, let, let there be confusion between L, you know, the head of the pantheon and L, a different God. And right. we're going to actually, I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing. Oh yeah. And we're going to, we're going to touch on that in, in a little bit as well. Okay, so we come to Yahweh. I wanted to kind of, you know, go through and, and, and deal with that, um, you know, de deal with uh, with El and deal with the grammar of that El, Elohim, Eloi. Deal with the grammar of that and then come into, um, come into Yahweh. And so we have Yahweh being, or however you want to pronounce it, Yod Hewahe, um, is the national god of Israel. The oldest known inscription found um, is in the Celeb inscriptions. Oh, my spelling is horrible. Referring to Shasu of Yahweh. And this is in the 14th century BCE. The Shasu were not Israelites, nor were they Hebrews. And I'll give some sources later. That's what that one and two are for. Yahweh went on to take on the attributes um, and become the personification of older a &E or ancient Near Eastern deities, chiefly Baal and El. Um, these were things that were put on him when he was made the national deity. When in actuality, something else we're going to touch on is that Yahweh was actually a lesser deity in the Canaanite pantheon. Mm. Um, he was not the supreme being. And when we say El Elyon, or as some people word it, the most high, and Yahweh are not synonymous, it's something that was, I guess for, for lack of a better way to say it, this is the glory of, you know, a mighty deity being handed to a lesser deity and then that deity put, being put on a pedestal. That's essentially what you have. Um, so, yeah, he went on to take out Houston to come to the Oh, my gosh. Over. You just um, said that like it wasn't nothing. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's not that it wasn't nothing. And I actually called Mitt um, because I was kind of as excited as I was when you, when you first called us for the show. And I think I appreciate you, you calling us. I think it's an excellent show and an excellent platform. When I took this, I wasn't really thinking because I know that I cut up on Facebook a lot. It is never... I don't want to hurt anybody like, yeah. you know, really hurt a person. So I really called Mitt beforehand to find out like, hey, um, you know, I've been putting this together and it, it's some of the stuff may be hard to swallow. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to damage anybody because it's not my intention. It's not my job to do that. 
Mm -hmm. um, and something he's always taught us, don't break anything that you're not willing to fix. And I don't want to be the guy that everybody on Facebook is calling at two o'clock in the morning, you know, saying, <laughs> hey, you know, That's I need true. you to explain That's it. True. That's true. So, yeah, but it, it's not that it's nothing. It's, it's very amazing, but it's also something that I've become used to. Um, I've yeah. had the opportunity to take in and absorb. Um, I fought with it as well, um, mm -hmm. some other people, but it's true. Right. So we wanted to talk about the majestic plural as well. Matter of fact, wait a minute, before we do that, was there something else I wanted to go into? We're going to touch some sources here a little bit later, but we're going to go ahead and go to this, um, <laughs> to Adonai. So Adonai is a plural and sensitive form of Adon. Um, Adon means Lord. Um, it, was used to, it was used in order to differentiate between human lords and Yahweh as Lord. Um, so you, you would say Adon for Adoni, my Lord for a human. Um, you would say Adonai when you're referring to Yahweh. All right. Some refer to, refer to it as the majestic plural, the pluralis excellentia, um, the pluralis insensivis. Um, the honorific plural, etc. These grammatical concepts, however, were unknown to the original authors and characters of pre-exilic texts. The word Elohim was used heavily in post-exilic literature to replace Yahweh to prevent usage of the ineffable name. Interesting to note, the word Adon or Lord is found in several Semitic languages and cultures. The word Adonai or Lord is not and is only found in the Hebrew Tanakh. The reason being is because the pointing is a unique literary construct um, created by the Wait a minute, I'm screwing up here. I'm sorry, bear with me. It's okay. Um, go back down there. All right. Uh, I thought I was there. Oh, yeah, I'm scrolling too fast. Okay. Um, let me see where we at. The reason being is because the pointing is a unique literary construct created by the Masoretes 600 CE to 1000 CE. Um, this is well after the creation of the literature contained within the Tanakh. So the majestic plural, um, plural majesty, um, intensive plurals, these aren't ancient Near Eastern things. These were added after the fact. And it's not saying that the Masoretes, because the next thing that someone on Facebook may say, um, so we can go ahead and explain and dispel this, they may say that, well, the Masoretes threw something in there, you know, to throw us a curveball, they were lying to us. That's not the purpose that they did that. They venerated the name to a point that they did not want to say it. Um, mm -hmm. That was why Elohim was used and they were saying and, and they and they used it as something of majesty or what and, and, and whatnot. Um so then they came with Adonai and they started using that um when they wanted to talk about Yahweh. So it wasn't something where they were trying to hide anything. Um it's just that most people who are reading it now don't understand, you know, the history of their text and they don't understand why these names are in there, why these words are there, why, you know, Changed it. it was honestly just done out of respect. That was why they changed it. It was in our respect and fear. Um, that's why they used Adonai. That's why they used Elohim. You will not find that in pre-exilic literature. It's not there. And if you do find it in pre-exilic literature, it's a sure sign that uh, those who have edited, redacted everything else with the Bible and with the Tanakh, they came back and changed that. Um, they've altered that. So um, you. Matter of fact, we're gonna we're gonna get into that as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and you know, just to say before you go in there, I I truly appreciate you breaking you know this down and um, even how how gently you are breaking it down because you know although it it can shatter some things, I, I think it's it's necessary for people to get the truth regardless, and um, you know it, they can digest it um, as they yeah. as they get it. However, the way you're breaking it down is very is is wonderful and, and i just want people to know again uh like the disclaimer said and he said as well this isn't to talk about anybody specifically this is just to get right. you to understand what this book is saying for real so go ahead mm -hmm. yeah i definitely don't want to hurt anybody um <clears throat> i don't mind smacking people around in debates on facebook that's fun to joke and tag people that's fun but like this is something i think that everybody on the line we, we really hold this type of information near and dear to us um, there are conversations that we, we have amongst ourselves that we won't talk about on Facebook. Um, we talk about amongst ourselves. We bounce ideas off of each other like, hey, what you think about this? And, you know, really dig and search. So some things we won't share at all. And I, and just like just like Sister said, um, very, she's a very sweet. Janelle is a very sweet and gentle spirit. She, she got some warrior in her. I see it. 
But um, yeah, she's right. We definitely the truth does have to get out, and hopefully it helps somebody. If you don't believe it, go look it up. Maybe we're lying, but right. you can always go look it up. You've got a smartphone, and I'm banking on you being smarter than your smartphone or being smart enough to use your smartphone. Indeed, indeed. All right, so I give my sources here. Um, anybody that would like to crap, I can get it to a position to where. I give some sources here and I'm actually going to go, I'm going to read through these sources here in a second. Um, and then we're going to actually get into some grammar, um, some more grammar here. But if you want to write these down or if you need them, um, you know, my name on Facebook is Yochanan Ben Yisrael. Yisrael is spelled wrong. It's Y apostrophe S R A E L. So if you want it, you know, if you don't, if you don't catch it, then feel free to inbox me. You don't have to send me a friend request if you don't want to, but feel free to just inbox me and say, Hey, I want to get, you know, the sources. I'll give them to you. All right, so we are about to get into some sources, and this is going to sing a little. So, all right, remember earlier I mentioned um, about the um, Shatsu of Yahweh, so we're going to get into a little bit of um, information on that. So, um, in 1844 CE, the ruins of the, of the ancient city of Soleb in Nubia was excavated by the archaeologist Carl Crap. <laughs> all right, let me get back to it. Oh, my goodness. It's okay. Uh, I really hate that I had to do this this way. I was prepared to do this in, in a much neater fashion, had it all pretty and everything, and then I had to quickly come up with something else, but we're going to get it right today. All right, we're going to start it over. In 1844 CE, the ruins of the city of Soleb in Nubia was excavated by the archaeologist Carl Richard Lepsius, who documented the site in detail but did not excavate. In 1907 CE, James Henry breasted arrived and photographed the site, but again, engaged in no excavation. It was not until 1957 CE that the team under the archeologist, Michaela um, Schiff Giorgini, um, excavated the site and found reference to a group of people described as Shasu of Yahweh. Shasu, they're going back and forth on the meaning. Um, if they went with the Hebrew meaning, it would be something like, um, it, it was a violent word. I can't remember what it was. It's um, something like pillage or something like that. Mm -hmm. If the word is rooted in, um, in Egyptian and like in Coptic language, um, it would be something like nomad. Um, so, the, but you know, it's described as Shasu of Yahweh. At the base of one of the columns of the temple in the um, hypostyle hall, the temple was built by uh, Amenhotep III, 1386 to 1353 BCE. Um, and the reference to Yahweh established that this God was worshiped by another people long before the time when the events of the biblical narratives are thought to have taken place. So this worship of and veneration of Yahweh, yod heh -Wah -Heh, is much older than um, the Israelite narrative, than, than the times that they, you know, the, the times that they document in the Bible is much older than that. So we can't say that at this point, it's safe to say, and I'll ask you the question, it's safe to say that if this happened long before the Israelites, that would mean that this God originally didn't belong to Israelites, right? Right. This God belonged to someone else. Okay. <laughs> Let's scroll down a little more. Um, the Shashu, also given Shashu, were a Semitic nomadic people described as outlaws or bandits by the Egyptians. And in fact, they are named on the column of the temple at Soleb uh, among Egypt's other enemies and appear later in an inscription from the reign of Ramses II, 1270, 1279 to 1213 BC, as among the Pharaoh's enemies at the Battle of Kadesh. Um, as it has been established, they were nomadic people um, attempts have been made to link them with the Hebrews and the Habaru, a group of renegades um, in the Levant, but these claims have been refuted. Whoever the Shasu were, they were not Hebrew, and the Habaru seem to be Canaanites who simply refused to conform to the customs of the land, not a separate ethnic group. Wow. So what this is showing us is that the people who originally worshipped Yahweh weren't Hebrews. They weren't Israelites. That's not who these people were. Um, this is, so apparently what it's, gonna, what it's telling me at this point is that someone adopted this deity. This deity came from somewhere else and we're gonna get to where else this deity came from. Um, now to anyone, this is not a jab to anyone who says that they are an Israelite. I so promise you. The information that you're going to find, just research it. If, if you don't believe it now, just research it because you may not like where this is going to go, but just research it and just have an open mind. Um, 
and and you were a good and moral person before, you know, you ever found out about this, I hope, or you, you have control of your, your morality. Um, so, you know, just, just research and look it up. Let's keep going. Cause I don't want to waste too much time. Um, okay. Although the biblical narratives depict, okay, wait, wait, actually it's something else I want to go to before we go to this. It's kind of out of order. All right, we can come back to that one. All right. Um, this was from another text. The source is up there. Another group of texts. Can you all see that, or do I need to make this bigger? Just a little bigger. All right. Yes. Yeah, I was struggling, so I figured everybody else might be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Another group of texts places the Shasu um, in South Trans Jordan. Short list of place uh, place names in Nubian temples of. Um, uh, Amenhotep III and Ram Ramses II uh, record six toponyms located in the land of Shasu. Those that can be identified are in the Negev or Edom. And one of the six, the ear in Edom, is found elsewhere in the connection with the Shasu. A monument of Ramses II claims that he has plundered the Shasu land, captured the mountain of Seir. A 19th dynasty model letter mentions the Shasu tribe of Edom. Ramesses III declares that he was he has destroyed the Syrites, which the Mount Seir is in um is in Edom, um, among the tribes of the Shashu. From the Egyptian viewpoint, then the Shashu were a prominent part of the Edomite population. Wow. Now, if we go to, I believe it's because I did not do this, but if I'm going off the top of my head, um, and this will probably be worth a grammatical breakdown later. I believe it is Deuteronomy 33 within the first like four or five verses. It literally says Moses is talking to the people, to the children of Israel. And he says that Yahweh came from the ear. Um, he, he says that he came from Edom. He literally says that you came, that he arose up from Edom. <laughs> he literally says that. So, um, the Shasu were, again, prominent part of the Edomite population. Um, so what we just discovered is that before Yahweh belonged to Israel, he belongs to Edom, mm -hmm. their mortal enemy. Um, so if, if we do more research, I don't think, I didn't do any slides on this. I should have. Um, Edom he he was the god. He he was a lesser deity within the Canaanite pantheon. In Edom, he wasn't the superior god. El was the superior god. The, he was the god. Yahweh would have been the god of metallurgy. Um, he he wasn't the god of. Uh, he wasn't the 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 creating god, the the all powerful god. He was a lesser deity in mm. Edom. Um, which this is all readily you can find all this information online. Um, I would I would suggest going to scholar.google.com. Um. And, and, and doing a little research. So we got to get back to the grammar. This part was fun, though. We get back to the grammar. And uh, let me make this a little smaller. All right. All right. So although the biblical narratives, because what we often think in, in regards to the Bible, oh, it's about monotheism. It's, it's about monotheism post-exile. It's not about monotheism. Um, before that, um, some parts were changed to display, you know, monotheism after the fact. But the Bible in itself, the Tanakh in itself, in its early portions, is not does not depict uh, monotheism. We're going to get to those verses. So, although the biblical narrative depicts Yahweh as the sole Creator, God, Lord of the universe, and God of the Israelites, especially initially, he seems to have been Canaanite in origin. Again, Edom was a Canaanite nation um, and subordinate to the supreme God El. Canaanite inscriptions mention a lesser God, Yahweh, and even the biblical book of Deuteronomy stipulates that the most high, the most high, El, gave to the nations their inheritance, and that Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob, and his allotted heritage. This is in Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. So, let's go and look at it. Let's see. We get, they've given it to us. When you have the ability to read the literature, you can say, hey, they just told us this. Let's go and find out exactly what it says um, to see if you know, we can agree to that. Mm -hmm. So we've got up right here, um, uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. Um, we'll read it. 
בהלכל עליון גויים בהפרידו בני אדם יעזב גבולות עמים למספר בני ישראל. Alright, so I don't think we really need to go through and parse every word. What we can do is look at the translation, um, and I'm going to give you another interesting fact about this as well. So what it says is in verse 8, um, it says, in causing or in giving the nations their inheritance, the supreme or highest deity, El Gnom, um, separated the children of the clone. The reason that we call them, the reason that I refer to them as clone, and I think a lot of us refer to them as clones, is because of what's in um, Genesis 126 to 128. It's pretty much the creation, genetic material is taken, and you know, something like something else is created. <clears throat> um, but he calls the borders of the nations to stand in regard to the number of the children of Israel. Okay, so we see that, um, we see that an inheritance is being given out from the highest deity. That's what we just read, you know, in the, 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 the article that I posted. Um, something cool to note about this, though, let's scroll down a little bit. There's an alternate ending to this verse. So the alternate ending for Q Duke J um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a scrap from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it doesn't end with Israel or B'nai Israel, it ends with B'nai Elohim, um, children or sons of, um, of the pantheon, of the gods. Um, that's how that verse went in. So um, that's just something interesting to note. I figured I would throw it in there. Um, I don't want to take up too much time dealing with that. But now we're going to verse 9. Verse 9 says, He is collect. Yahweh, Amor, uh, Yaakov, Hebel, uh, I can hardly see, Nachalato, Nachalato. All right, so let's see what this translates out to. I've got the word for word part. If anybody ever wants to, just let me know and I can give it to you. Um, so because the inheritance of Yahweh is his people, Jacob is the measure of his inheritance. Mm. So we have El giving out inheritance, inheritances, and we have right here where it says Yahweh received an inheritance. He received an inheritance from the highest deity. So this separates, this alone separates those two deities, Yahweh not being the most high deity, at least in early literature. He isn't the most high deity. He's a part of the structure. He was given an inheritance too, that inheritance being Jacob. Wow. Um, I can't yeah. tell you how many times I've heard that there is the same, you know, um, and and it's like no, it, it's it's clearly distinctly different. But I've heard a lot of people tell me that you know they, you know, meditated on it or whatever, and they were given that <laughs> it's the same. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's really not. Um, they're far from the same. <laughs> um, it, it, again, post exilic literature when Israelites went versus. They're, they're not the same. Pre-exilic, before they went into exile, versus when they went into exile and came out. They are pretty much not the same people anymore. Their beliefs aren't the same. The way they practice aren't the same. Then you have people, um, you would have Judaism come along, and it wants to push a monotheistic vantage point. This isn't, um, this isn't the harp on Jews, you know, hour, but they wanted to push a monotheistic viewpoint um, versus, you know, a good point, another good point, as, as we talk, this is, we're supposed to be talking about grammar, before the discovery of the temple, before the discovery of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah being Ugaritic, they didn't know about Ugaritic. Jew, early Jews didn't know about Ugaritic. Mm. Um, they didn't know what it was. I think it was discovered in like the 60s. If I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure my brothers will, will definitely correct me. But it wasn't until I think around the 60s that that was found. Um, this actually gives us a look back at the Israelite religion. You know, their, their cult of Yahweh gives us a, an opportunity to look back at it. Not only that, it gives us an opportunity to look back at the language um, and, and see how it functions. So they didn't, I'm going to be honest with you, their interpretation and their understanding of what ancient, you know, biblical literature was, was wrong as well. You know what I'm saying? It was just, to be completely honest, theirs was wrong as well. Um But let me move on because I, I don't want to harp because I know what I got. I'm, I'm probably already outside of my time. But I'm going to finish this. Pa um, a passage like this reflects the early beliefs of the Canaanites and Israelites in polytheism, or more accurately, henotheism, the belief in many gods with a focus on a single supreme deity. That's what you're seeing pre-exile. 
Mm. Um, the claim that Israel always only acknowledged one God is a later belief passed back on the early days of Israel's development in Kalaan. Um, so yeah, that's what, what, what you're actually seeing is um, when, when you read this or, you know, redactors um, coming back and changing the text um, to, you know, fit, you know, their, their, their current model. You know, it, it's, it's like we started here. We're here now. We want to go back to make disagree with us. Um, the same thing happened with the New Testament. Um, so we got, we've got to be critical of both, both sides of the book. It's, it's more than enough criticism to go with the Tanakh or what's called the Old Testament, um, just like it is the New Testament. Right. All right. So I went to, this is from Yale. Um, so this is Yahweh is Baal, because I mentioned earlier that Ooh. Yahweh um, took on some attributes as Baal. Let me make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. I'm going to have to hurry up and get this done, because I know I'm probably outside of my time limit. Although identified explicitly as El um, in Exodus 6.3, Yahweh also has a number of traits in common with Baal. Like Baal, he is called Rider on the, cloud, rider on the Clouds. I actually had somebody bring this verse up to me the other day and asked what I thought of it, and this was what I told him. <laughs> um, and there are allusions to a battle with sea, sea or river um, in Exodus 15, Psalms 114, and Isaiah 51, 9 through 11. That's actually a very interesting thing in Hebrew. Um, thus, Yahweh is a composite of features of El and Baal. This new deity required a new name, and it was fitting that with, uh, new, with the new God be introduced at the time of the Exodus, which sees the formation of, of a new people uh, about to make the transition from the semi-nomadic tent-dwelling existence um, of the patriarchs, whose God, El, also dwelled in a tent, to the settled urban way of, of life in Canaan. The Canaanite Baal lived in a house. Um, this, if anybody ever does research on it, gets a lot deeper, especially if you get into things like the, um, the owl cycle and whatnot. It gets a whole lot deeper than that. Um, let me see, do I have any more here? I thought I had one more, or did I? Nope, that was it. So, I'm going to let that conclude, um, because I know I've gone past my time. I don't really want to too much get into reading and parsing out anything else, but, yeah, yeah. um, I'm going to let that conclude. So, like, if there are questions, if brothers want to jump in and tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> well, like, that's, please, that's please. something, too, that, you know, we've seen that not only was the language borrowed, but God's was being borrowed. You know what right. I mean? And that's something and, and, that people don't even think about or, or know. Yeah. And, I mean, you can look at Baal, um, you know, as Marduk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's... Um, what it is, we have stories that are told that are repeated. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're, and I don't want to go too far left into that, but you have stories that are just changed and modified. The characters are changed and modified to suit a new people, to suit a, a new motive, which I think the white is going to uh, get into what some of those motives may have possibly been. Um, so I don't want to take anything from that because I know he's got a beautiful presentation, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, does anybody have anything to add or? Yeah, does anybody else want to add on that? Yo, Kanan, you the devil the Bible speaks of. <laughs> I know, man. I know. You already know me. I, I, I wear that badge with honor, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, man. All right. I mean, thank you for that breakdown, though, because it, it really does change things when you know, you know, what's being conveyed in the text. And and the reality is, is that, again, this isn't to be like, oh, y'all wrong and CC, you know, it's not that. It's just what's being taught is incorrect and people need right. to know. And this is why, this is another reason why it's so important to be able to break it down in its original language is because it's so much that's not touched on. It's so much that you, that you miss when you're depending on somebody else to do it for you, so. Right, because I know that um, JG, I already know my brother probably could have went on for hours and hours on that mm -hmm. topic, just like we go on for hours and hours on the, every topic that's, that's up here exactly. is so big. I mean, every topic on here that you chose, I mean, you hit you hit, you hit, hit the nail on the head when you picked them, because these are some big topics. But people, we could really, there's so much information on this and so much proof. Um, and it's like, you know, it, it goes beyond, I don't want to harp on the, because it's Christmas too, but I don't want to harp on the Israelites too much. But mm -hmm. it's like, when they come on, I was just telling my sister the other day in a debate group, 
the things that you're bringing that you think are scholarship, this isn't scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. None of these people that you're bringing, you know, on this topic of debate, none of them hold scholarship in, you know, any form, in any regard on the topics that they're speaking on. Mm -hmm. um, the topics they're speaking on have actually been debunked and abused, <laughs> you know, over the years yep. by mm -hmm. scholars. I mean, it's, it's like, how you say it, you got a dead body, you're kicking a dead body. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I mean, it's it not, it, well, I'm going to throw him under the bus. It's like, recall, when he took on, what's your boy, James White? Um, <laughs> when you saw an actual <laughs> scholar, someone who was an actual scholar in this, someone an actual scholar in, in um, committed linguistics versus someone who's looking at a strong support. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, so, yeah, and it's not about their religious belief, um, because I'm not Christian. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not about a religious belief. It's, it's about information. It's like information, whether it's being given, you know, if I give you the information and it's correct versus JG giving you the information is correct versus Mitt versus anybody. If you got mm -hmm. someone that's, you know, somebody could be Hindu and be a great, you know, math teacher. Someone, you know, someone who is someone who is um, a Buddhist may decide, hey, I want to become a scholar in, in North, Northwestern um, Semitic languages. That doesn't, whatever their belief is, is what their belief is, the information they're bringing forth as far as grammar and as far as history, if that's right, it is what it is. Right, right, right. Now, I, I really appreciate you breaking that down, and I, I pray everyone received that well, you know, and, and let it digest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, y'all don't have to, it don't have to be earth shattering, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you can right. just let it digest, digest and come back to it, and, and then just use, again, he's willing to give you uh, the, the, the documents to support it. So, all right. right, man, this next one that we're about to move into. <laughs> um, again, because we lack the competence of being able to read things ourselves, it opens us up to, it opens us up to accepting concepts and then basing our livelihoods on those concepts. And, and with this next one, I'm not purposing to say that you're not who you say you are, just because this next one is going to debunk a lot of lies that are out there. So don't take it that way. It's just understanding what the text is saying. So this next topic is, does the Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh, does it speak of the transatlantic slave trade and Deuteronomy that everybody says it does uh the short answer is no as a matter of fact i'm gonna translate that into spanish nope i'm even gonna translate that into italian nope um but you know just to you know all jokes aside um i can see how some can come with that conclusion based off of the information that they do have. And what do you know? I have a uh, 1611 edition King James uh, right yeah. here. Um, so we're gonna go to the, the infamous, well, famous or infamous verse, uh, however you wanna uh, look at it. Uh, Deuteronomy 2868. And I don't know if y'all can actually uh, see that, but um. it says, and I'll try to do this in my my finest British. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. That's all well and good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Dilly, dilly. Um, I can I can see how um, I can see how you know somebody can read that and pick up on a few keywords, namely um, being where you will be sold to your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, or being brought to a location by ships. And even if we want to get a uh, hermeneutic with it, you know, oh, this is spiritual Egypt and look at the symbolism of the, the, the eagle on the, the flagpole and the obelisk in Washington, D.C. and mm -hmm. whatever have you, you know, what I'm saying, um, granted, those symbols ain't got nothing to do with what they think it is, but it is what it is. Uh, we're not we're not going to all of that. Um, but that's what the King James Version says. And as as was thought, as was said earlier, you know. When, 
when you have an axe to grind, whether social or political or even a religious axe to grind, and you even have a beef with a particular ethnic group, you're going to induct things into your movement that will ostracize and marginalize the people that you don't like, you know? So if there was ever a need, I'm not saying that this was the case, but let's just, let's just, you know, use our minds for a second. If there was ever a need to justify shackling people up and putting them on boats because your God espoused it, well, what better way than to you utilize the text out of your book to say that this is what happens to you or whatever the case is, if you are not a child of God as the Anglo-Saxon, uh, right. the 17th century Anglican Church of England decides, you know, what a child of God is. Um, now, like I said, that may not have been the case. You know, I, I'm taking liberties with that statement, but unfortunately, it's not exactly far-fetched. <laughs> um, so, you know, we have what the 1611 King James says about Deuteronomy 28, 68. So we're going to explore what the uh, the biblical um, text itself says in its uh, language of attestation. Um, and we're going to read from here. All right, so this first word uh, is causative active. Uh, so he failed third masculine singular in the perfect. However, this uh, wild conjunction here inverts the um, the perfect to an imperfect. It's a wekatal. And uh, we have the root, sheen, shuruk, vape, meaning to return or to, you know, say revisit or something along the lines. And being that this is a cause of active stem um, attached to our uh, suffix here, this uh, second masculine singular suffix, and he shall return you, Yahweh, this is our deity uh, or the object in question, or uh, the subject rather, this is the verb, this is the subject, and this is the object. But anyway, um, this is our uh, subject in question, Yahweh, this third masculine singular of Hawa, uh, meaning to exist, to be, to cause, to happen, or something along the lines. And this is it. This is it in itself a cause of active stem. So it shall cause to exist. Uh, Mitzrayim. This is an interesting word here. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and translate it as Egypt. Uh, but the root of it is Zor or Zorar, meaning to be distressed, to be bound, uh, to be under siege. Um, you know, it's uh, um, it's 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 you can have the Gemini Zorar which has similar meanings, or you can have the, the CVC, uh, the consonant vowel consonant uh, root, uh, Zor, which has similar meanings. But however, uh, we'll get, when we get to the translating, we'll see why this is an interesting word. Uh, but Anyot, uh, the root word here is Ania, which means a ship. We have an inseparable preposition, bait right here, meaning in or on, well, yeah, in, among, you know, something like that. Um, Anyot, this, um, this uh, holam while, uh, I mean, this holam while and tau suffix is indicating a, uh, a feminine plurality. All right, then uh, baderic, our root darak, meaning to tread or to uh, to travel in a sense, uh, inseparable preposition, bait in uh, asher. This is a demonstrative ad, ad, uh, demonstrative uh, ever. I believe in which no, it's just an adverb or substantive of one of them things, uh, but it just means that or which or that which. Amarti, we have our root aleph mem resh, meaning to say, to utter, to convey. This is the first common singular uh, perfect, um, indicated by the um, the suffix ending tau uh, yod. Uh, indicating that it is the first person that is saying that like, like, that I said, or something along the lines. Uh, all right, look uh, prepositional uh, phrase. Um, this is our uh, inseparable preposition, Lamet. This is our second masculine singular um, object suffix. Uh, so this is to you or for you. Well, but you know, context dictates that. Lo, particle of negation. Dosif, this is the second masculine singular perfect cow of uh, of yasaf first uh yod verb this we can tell that this is not a first noon 
being that uh, there's no germination in the uh, second root radical here. Um, there's no dogish germination there. So we know it's not a first noon. We know it's a first yo. Uh, performative tau, no dogish germination. Yeah, and then, you know, um, the heated yo, pay, uh, so feet. Anyway, um, ought, this is a, substan a substantive to denote repetition. Um, this is uh, lir ot, rooted from ra uh, Well, I'm sorry, lir uh, This is rooted from uh, ra -a, meaning to see, to perceive, or to conceive. Um, not conceive in the sense of birthing, but you know, to you know, to visualize, whatever. Um, now, this right here, this this the word right here. This, 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 this the word right here. Wahit uh, makartem, rooted from makar, which means to sell. This is in the hit payel, um, and it has a second masculine plural ending. And this is a an intensive reflexive. This is not a causative reflexive. This is not a pull all in the sense of this is not an action being committed unto you, or this is not the cause of an action being committed. This is intensive reflexive, meaning that you, you do it to yourself. Uh, sham, this is a uh, demonstrative adverb, meaning there or over there. Um, lo oiveka, um, you have oiv, 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 which is, it means to be an enemy. Um, and you have your inseparable preposition lamet here, your second masculine singular suffix, uh, so to your enemies. Um, la avadim, you have avad meaning to serve, to toil, to uh, to be in uh, a uh, form of servitude or, you know, a servant or so to speak. And this is a now masculine uh, plural indicated by this hedic yod mem. So your, your inseparable preposition plus your plural, so for servants, and your consecutive uh, while conjunction, lishpachot, uh, this is rooted by the term shuf, means to grab really hard or to bruise. You see this in Genesis in terms of bruising the head and bruising the heel. Uh, I forget exactly, somewhere in Genesis 3, like 15, four, something like that. Um, all right, and well, I'm your consecutive conjunction while uh, ain, ain, excuse me, not ain, ain, uh, mean it's a particle of negation. Uh, so to be without, you know, um, and konya, this is an uh, active participle of kana, meaning to buy or to redeem. So if we were to um, actually translate this word for word, we have, and he shall cause you, Yahweh, he shall cause you ret to return, Yahweh, Misraim. Now, we're not just going to say, oh, to Ms. Mar Ms. Rahim, but however, there is a there is a mark here that indicates that there is a, let me get the focus in, that indicates that there is a scribal uh, note to say that there is something interesting about this. This is called a Severin, um, which is come from, it comes from the Aramaic term, suppose. So they propose another um, word that should be there so as we can see right here the focus clears up verse 68 the severe the what is supposed it uh you know word that should be there is mitzrayima using the directional hey so we can we can deduce that it you know what's being inferenced here is to mitzrayim so he shall return yahweh he shall return you yahweh to mitzrayim in ships in a way which i said to you uh not again shall you continue or not you shall repeatedly or you will not ever you know to put it in our terms you will not ever see uh la rota see her uh again you know what i'm saying or it meaning again well hit them all right so this is an in uh this is a intensive reflexive verb in other words you do it to yourself if the verb is makah, which is what it is, which means to sell. It doesn't mean that you will be sold as uh, King Jimmy had put it. You know, it, you know, there ye shall be sold unto your enemies. However, the text is saying you shall sell yourselves there to your enemies. Right. So if we first off acknowledge the fact that you they're, they're selling themselves, they're not being put on 
on the stage and there's a, a auction going on for a mm-hmm. book or a, a a sow, if you will. I don't want to use the other term, mm-hmm. but um, they're selling themselves. Mm-hmm. All right. So now let's if we analyze the transatlantic slave trade, because it was all good when, you know, saying we was in ships by New York. You know what I'm saying? It was all good when we were in ships. But now we're selling ourselves. Right. All right. So a lot of people like to say, well, Africans sold Africans. OK, let, let's let's entertain that thought for a second. Some there. Did Africans come to America to sell Africans? Mm. I don't think so. Even if America is spiritual Egypt, you know, if you know, as, as King Jimmy say, if uh, if we're in, in Egypt, you know what I'm saying, and America is spiritual Mizraim, did Africans sell to America to sell other Africans? No, the text says you shall sell yourselves there. Where? In Mizraim. So there's some things that aren't connecting there. All right. And the last thing that doesn't quite connect is to your enemies for servants and for slave girls. For mm. slave girls. But without a buyer. Last time, like- I'm just saying the last time that I checked during the transatlantic slave trade, there were buyers. Yes, sir. They split up mother, uh, father, child, 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 uncle, auntie, don't even matter because mm-hmm. somebody else bought them. Yep. So this text is saying that, that you will go, go to a place in a fashion, in ships, in a fashion which I told you you'll never see again, and you'll push yourself for sale, but nobody's going to buy you. Mm. That, that automatically disqualifies Deuteronomy 2868 from having anything to do with the transatlantic slave trade. Just the very notion of being up for sale and not being bought. All right, if so they, that's a crime. That? that translation is a crime for people to have this this long been using that to justify, you know, their position that uh, black people sold and that we, you know, are whomever people uh, because of that. And right. it's even saying that. Right. It, it's an absolute crime. And to further show how much of a crime it is, just to give a little background on Deuteronomy 28, as it is, if you notice the first 14 verses are blessings, you know what I'm saying, so to speak, for obedience to a specific contract or contractual agreement, while the last 53 verses are curses for mm-hmm. breaches of contract, right? All right, so Deuteronomy itself, there is scholarship. Uh, there's a gentleman, what's this guy's name? Marvin Sweeney wrote in 2001 that King Josiah, the scroll that he found during the, the renovation of the temple, it was not the Torah itself, but it, it was either the book of Deuteronomy or portions of the book of Deuteronomy. It mm-hmm. was literally Sefer HaTorah, meaning the book of the instruction, right? Or a book of the instruction. As, uh, as opposed to Hasefer HaTorah, which would be the book of the instruction. Mm-hmm. So, that, you know, that difference between Sefer HaTorah, you know what I'm saying, it, it kind of makes, it It can make a difference. I'm not going to, you know, put it out there like it's just adamant, but it can make a difference. So just a little background on, uh, okay, uh, all right, Dania, Dania. All right, I'm going to open up a book again real quick. Danielle just commented that Zion Lakes had broken down the passage similarly, but not to suggest that it doesn't apply to the slave trade, just not in the way most teach how it does. Um, I am familiar with the way in which Zion Lakes had translated that, and I'm going to show exactly uh, where he went wrong. All right, so I, and I believe my teacher, uh, Mitz, actually spoke on this some time ago. I don't know exactly when. But uh, Zion Lex, he insists that you shall return, he shall return you, Yahweh, Miss Raim. All right. This is conspicuously missing a inseparable preposition in the Masoretic text. All right. So Zion Lex insists that this is a condition, 
as in servitude or bondage or distresses. You know what I'm saying? So he shall return you Yahweh distresses. Like Yahweh is going to return distresses upon you. There's two things wrong with that. Number one, he's going to return you distresses in ships. So he's going he's gonna to send boats full of distresses to you. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes no sense. All right. And number two, right here, this is where in the Masoretti text, this is uh, the one that I have. I don't, I don't, I don't have a, a Billy Hebraic on, on hand right now. I have no idea what that thing is. I think I lost it in transit. Um, but in this particular Masoretti text, they have notation for words that, um, that stand out. You know, the Severine, the Severine, you know, meaning supposedly, and I, I think I covered this a second ago, but this is a, an alternative that is uh, that is suggested in light of there not being a directional indicator written down. So the thing about the Masoretic text is they were very, very, very much um, meticulous, no pun intended, in their vocalization of the text. So that if they if they heard it wrong, they wrote it wrong, but they also made notation to say that this may be incorrect, you know, in other places. That's the thing about the Masoretic text. They did not want to, they didn't want to write down what they did not hear. So they didn't, but they did make notation elsewhere just to maintain the integrity of the Torah scroll as they knew it. So uh, no, you weren't put, putting into a, a desperate condition. You know, <laughs> the, these people were literally sent off into, you know what I'm saying? They were, they were, they were sent off into Egypt. Um, and to give a little background on that. All right. So as I said, uh, Deuteronomy itself it is not, uh, yeah, Sean Harris, I think I, I think I just went over that, how the Masoretic text has its flaws, but they do notate how they go about correcting those flaws. You know, they make notations with, um, the accents themselves right. in order to say, Hey, look down here. This is what we think is happening here. You right. know, so they, they kind of self-correct, you know, yeah. and they've already said <laughs> it, you know, yeah. But yeah. Go ahead. They, they kind of self-correct, you know what I'm saying? So like, I, I just, the you know, just, just another little quick gander, you know, I'm not even going to use uh, Deuteronomy 20, 2868. All right. So you have all these, accent marks and these punctuations and such right a lot of that stuff comes down to here and it's explained in this sub in, in the subtext right here on whatever mistake may have been made or a, a, an alternative vocalization or an alternative spelling if you will so they they do self-correct you know the Masoretic text itself is just how it's transmitted how they heard it mm -hmm. but they go back and say hey this could be a possible misunderstanding, you know? So I think, I think we're too hard on the Masoretti text. Like mm -hmm. just for, I'm not going to say for no reason, but it's just because we don't, we don't really give it the time of day to really study it uh, and to see what is, what's really going on with it. And the Biblia Hebraic Stuttgartensia is a very good tool so that you can actually see what's going on in the Masoretti text, because they do say, Hey, I, I think this is a mistake. We can, we can look at this, this version. Uh, matter of fact, Deuteronomy 2868, where it doesn't say Misraim or Le Misraim, in the Samaritan text, it actually says Misraim with the directional hey. So, you know, so it gives you the ability to do textual criticism, you know. Mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was said to be found by Malek Yoshiahu or King Josiah around the 18th year of his reign. This will be approximately 622 BCE. All right, so the interesting thing about this time period is that some time before, uh, you had Esarhaddon, who was the, the epitome of the Assyrian Empire, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and he had his vassal treaties, his succession treaties, with his vassal states, where there was a contract. If you do this, I will do this for you. If you break away from this, then... I will break away from you. Uh, Garfield, uh, what does it mean with the Samaritan text? Same thing. It just means you'll go to Egypt or to Misraim, however one wishes to um, to um, translate that, you know. But anyway, so Eshabanapal was his uh, his son, which succeeded Eshabanapal. Mm -hmm. And during the reign of Eshabanapal, 
or during, after, you know, you started to have civil war in Assyria over uh, succession and who was actually going to rule. And the Assyrian empire was crumbling. Meanwhile, Babylon, on the other hand, the Neo-Babylonian empire was on the rise. They were, they were gaining power very swiftly and as swiftly as the Assyrian empire was losing it. So if we look at Esarhaddon, which is it's a very interesting thing with Esarhaddon, he was notated as the king of Assyria, the king of Babylon, the king of Egypt and uh, Kush, and also the king of the universe. Mm -hmm. This is a title that is also given to the deity uh, yod heh wau -Heh in Amos, you know? So in the sense of a divine absolute monarchy, Esther Haddon was low key God. Mm -hmm. Just being real with you, like he was low key God, you know what I'm saying? It was to be addressed and, and respected as such. So in the sense of divine absolute monarchy, his word was law, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a little bit of background. And by the time that Josiah or Yoshiahu came to reign, this was 640 uh, BCE roundabout, Assyrian Empire was falling. Their God and his plan was failing. So there had to have been some mode of reestablishing some type of belief in the, you know, the Israelite existence, if you will. So a scroll was miraculously found while the temple was being renovated and the contractual agreements within it, namely Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 13, are oddly reflective of Assyrian vassal treaties and succession treaties in their presentation. Just to give a good example, uh, we're going to compare the uh, Vassal Treaty of Esarhaddon, subsection uh, 39, um, to Deuteronomy 28 27. Deuteronomy 28 27 says, Yahweh will afflict you with the boils of Egypt with ulcer, scurvy, and itch of which you cannot be healed. Meanwhile, the Vassal Treaty of Esarhaddon in subsection 39 says, May sin, the brightness of heaven and earth, clothe you with leprosy and forbid you from entering the presence of the gods or king roam the desert like a wild ass and a gazelle. So in other words, there's going to be sickness afflicted on you if you, you know, disobey this, that, or the third. And just another example, we can go to the, the next line uh, of both passages, uh, subsection 40 of the Esarhaddon Treaty or Deuteronomy 28 and 28 and 29. It says, Yahweh will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. You shall grope about at noon as blind people grope in darkness, but you shall be unable to find your way and you shall continually be abused, robbed without anyone to help. All right. That's a hadn't treated. May Shemash, the light of heaven and earth, not judge you justly. May he remove your eyesight. Walk about in darkness. So we can see that there are some some comparisons there with how Deuteronomy 28 is presented versus how the Esarhaddon and Vassal Treaties or the Succession Treaty is presented. And if we were to make any deductions, all right, by the way, um, I'll have to get John Yell, the, uh, the, the, the source of the, uh, the comparison mm -hmm. between the Vassal Treaty and Deuteronomy 28. Um, but it's for, by a woman named C.L. Crouch, Israel and the Assyrians, Deuteronomy, the Succession Treaty of Esarhaddon, and the Nature of Subversion. And in this text, she is basically saying that in order to prove that subversion or the um, uh, subversion is basically the, um, the undermining of an, of an existing authority, in order to prove that that exists, there has to be some type of of signaling to the uh, audience of Deuteronomy that they are undermining the Assyrian Empire. All right, now I'm not saying she's wrong. I'm not saying she's right. That's for the, the the reader to decide. Should they look into that work? But what I do say, on the other hand, is that you have one empire failing, which is Assyria. You have another empire rising, which is Babylon, and your vassalhood or your 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 uh, your loyalties so to speak your political loyalties really hang in the balance because if you ride with assyria and you get destroyed you just get destroyed but if you ride with babylon who's rising up and they get destroyed then assyria is going to destroy you so you kind of hung in the balance there 
you know it's it's, it's a very complicated um it's a very complicated deal uh to answer garfield's question i have not found a, con a connection with verse 68 specifically but i'm not going to say that one doesn't exist i'm just not aware of it um but you know the idea is this deuteronomy 28 was a contract with the the, the israelite deity instead of relying on the power of this king, the power of that king, or the power of that king in their empires. So it was a contract with the deity itself so as to solidify and emphasize Israelite identity in the growing mayhem that was Mesopotamia and the ancient Near East during the seventh century of uh, before our current era. Deuteronomy 28.68 is but a condition that is reflective of mm -hmm. the Assyrians and their form of giving vassal treaties, because we have to think about it. Assyria has been the world power for ooh, almost a hundred years before, if it hadn't even came into the picture, you know, so, and and continued to be so until well after Esau hadn't had left in six oh uh, until six oh nine BCE when they dismantled, or when they had been finally taken over by the Babylonian period uh, uh, kingdom, if you will. So you know. When 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 you have been so assimilated into a vassalhood from a, a nation like Assyria, you're going to adopt some of the things and some of the ways in which they do things mm -hmm. from their religion all the way down to their culture, to their political uh, writings and documentation and such. So, you know, Deuteronomy, in my opinion, you know, with what I have seen thus far is just a reminder to Israel in the fashion of the Assyrians that you are somebody, you have a God, you have a culture, stick with that. Cause mm -hmm. if you don't, all of this crap is going to happen to you. And we can honestly look and see how some of these things did happen um, in terms of the exile. Yeah. You know, like they were, uh, let me see. Uh, I had it wrote down somewhere. And I don't want to go, I don't want to freestyle off the head, but um, we can, if we were to read about the uh, the Babylonian exile, regardless of uh, if it's in Jeremiah, limitations, uh, parts of Ezekiel, you know, or um, even, a, even a small portion of uh, Isaiah, we can see that some of the things that happened or were prescribed in Deuteronomy 28 as punishments had happened within the book itself already. And I, for the life of me, I cannot find where I wrote that down at. Otherwise, I would have it and give it to you verbatim. You know what I'm saying? Uh, verse to verse, you know, side by side. Um, but if we actually read the book, we can see that there are items that, that we can say, hey, this sounds like this or this mm -hmm. sounds like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm not one that says that it's a prophecy or something that was to happen 2,700 years later. You know, that's not that's not that's not what I would, what I would do. <laughs> um, but I would indeed say that it is reflective of the socio political climate uh, mm -hmm. when Deuteronomy was composed, transmitted, or quote unquote found. If right. you, and yeah, that, that's all I got. Man. I'm gonna be real with you. That one right there, I've 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 heard so many times, and people, you know, they base their understanding of who they are, or whatnot, based on that. And it's like, again, this is not attacking anybody personally with your personal belief or, or situation. It's just you can you can do what you're doing without using incorrect information. Right, you know, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to. You don't have to make it try to say what you want it to say and make it to your point, you know, um, because you're just not going to do that, not with somebody that can actually read it. And so uh, that that was excellent breaking down. I'm glad you went in the way you did because people need to know that difference. And one thing you find when you are doing the work is that the writings are not consecutive, you know, like, this book was written this time, this book was written, and then the scope of it all what they were doing, what was the the motive behind writing it. And right. what, it's so many more factors you got to take into consideration. It's not just somebody with a good heart that want to tell you about God. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and to piggyback on what Yokanah was bringing up, mm -hmm. you have people, 
All right, so the Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is literally, you know, according to the documentary hypothesis, is literally the youngest of the books of the Torah. So you have the 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 youngest of the books of the Torah, and the entire Tanakh is being redacted in light of this document. So there are going to be some things that are changed to reflect the views of the Deuteronomist or the Yahwist or the Eloist or you know what I'm saying, the the the, the um J E P D uh Yahwist, Eloist, Priestly, and Deuteronomist. But Deuteronomy is the one that like the last one. That's the that's the scroll. If we you know want to take it there, that's the scroll that they found that like latest, <laughs> you know, that's the latest you know one that they found. So everything else is gonna be through the lens. Let's go back and change this to what we believe now, you know. And we can see in Ezra or where he actually ended up redacting, you know. So it's not like it's just a pure document that's been untouched, you know, and it's just virgin pen and paper or virgin paper and ink. It has its changes. And, you know, if you read the text, you can see where, you know, certain things look like they've been forced. Right. Um, you know, so it, you know, this ain't somebody with a good heart deciding to just give you what God gave them. No, this is a hey, this is the political changes we had to endure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the, the the religious changes that we've had to endure. Mm -hmm. And at the moment of the last redaction, they were strictly monotheistic. So mm -hmm. everything is going to reflect that. Right. They have, to, they have to go back and say, hey, look, these people messed up. They was worshiping Baal and Asherah instead of mm -hmm. Yahweh. So guess what? This is what happened to them. You know, yeah. they have to have somebody to blame it on, something to pin it on, you know. Exactly. And yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, because I yeah, this this could go for three, four hours, but <laughs> yeah, understandably. And yeah, you know, a lot of people like to make it seem like the people, you know, from whomever wrote it, it is is like, oh, they were just these perfect people. It's like, no, they had they was doing little sneaky stuff too, like you know, is but all right, guys, so we're going to move to our last topic. Uh, first off, thank you uh, for that breakdown, Burley. We really appreciate that. Sure, sure. For this last one. And this one right here, y'all, this one right here. It's um, It takes responsibility to hear this one. And I say that because that's all you're going to be able to depend on once once this one is destroyed. So <laughs> uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to go into bringing on um, the... Mr. Uh, what, what did he say? Divine Lex when he first came on. Yeah, Divine Lex. That's right. Appreciate that. <laughs> and we're going to talk about is Satan the devil character in the Hebrew Bible? You take okay. All right. So, uh, um, so, uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, Kaim Musga Harasha Nimza Betoch Hatanach. So is the concept of the devil found within the Hebrew Bible or Tanakh? Kaim Hasatan Oeb Yahweh. So is Satan or the Satan the enemy of Yahweh? And of course, we're going to be exploring the Hebrew Bible to satisfy the inquiry. I am Hasatan Nimza Bagan. I was the Satan or Satan located or found in the garden. All right, so uh, what we want to do, I'm going to move quickly to this. Um, so for those that are uh, partial to um, scripts, <laughs> say the Phoenician script, paleo, whatever you want to call it. This is what it's going to look like. Hasatan. Uh, if you're using Arabic block script, this is what it's going to look like. Hasatan. This will be our definite article, making this an emphatic noun, a masculine singular emphatic noun. Hasatan. Hasatan. Uh, this will be our masculine singular noun. Okay. Satan. Satan. And please notice the conspicuous absence of the definite article. So this would be an indefinite noun. Satan, Satan. And here we have Hanochash. Hanochash. All right. Hanochash. All right. So if um, the first question is the concept of the devil 
found within the Hebrew Bible. So to our facilitator, um, have you ever heard uh, anyone talk about a devil being found in the Bible? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I've often been called the devil um, of which the Bible speaks. Um, <laughs> so I'm assuming that the devil must be somewhere in there. Um, so what have you heard concerning the devil and the Bible? Um, I've heard that, you know, the devil was kicked out of heaven, um, came down into the garden and tricked Eve and Adam. Uh, I've heard that the devil, you know, is this enemy of God. And, you know, uh, basically all the evil in the world is because of, every, you know, people who follow the devil, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So being kicked out of heaven, we could just probably right off the top. That's a Echna Falta Min Hashemayim Halel Ben Shakar. So, yeah, the name is Halel Ben Shakar and not um, Hasatan. So it didn't say Echna Falta Min Hashemayim Hasatan. <laughs> it said Halel Ben Shakar. So, um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, it is kind of interesting how they, they just really just a way to do plug and play on that all right so um yeah that's interesting all right and so the concept of the um and what does the devil do what i mean what is the devil's role well uh traditionally i would say the devil's role is to tempt you and to purpose to get you to do all kinds of sins against god basically so is is Satan a friend of God or an adversary of God, enemy of definitely, God? Definitely an adversary. Definitely uh, shown and, and, and taught as an adversary of God. Definitely. Okay. Have you ever heard anyone say it was Satan in the garden tempting the woman? Mm-hmm. All yeah. the time. Yeah. And she was always trying to be an independent woman, strong, independent woman. <laughs> and has she been in the presence of a man that never would have happened? I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they probably... Yeah. Going ad nauseum on that, right? She was the weaker one, so he went after her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So um, I think what we can do, well, I know what we're going to do. We're going to um, address um, places of attestation where we can see the Hasatan in use, the Satan in use, and the Hanachash. So we're going to satisfy the question of is Satan or the Hasatan the enemy um, of Yahweh? Uh, we're going to use the Job text to do that. Um, we're going to look to satisfy the concept, is the devil um, like this disobedient thing, um, the one that's always trying to war with God and kill, steal, and destroy? Is that a product of the Hebrew Bible? Um, and was the Satan um, in the garden? All right, so let's um, quickly um, take a peek. All right, so um, if everyone wants to turn with me to um, uh, Gene of Isis. <laughs> Remember when people used to say that? Gene of Isis. All right, Genesis or Better Sheet, Chapter 3. Um, so um, say amen when you're there. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and just read and just we're going to just take a peek and see if we can find um, Hasatan. Ready? All right. And I'm not sure if, any, if y'all can see this well enough, but. I'm sorry for that. Of Kia Marlo Himlo to Akalu, may call Ed the Hangan. All right, so we would be looking for the Hasatan to be right here. So this begins our garden epic. So we would be expecting to see Hasatan here. Now, um, right off the bat, uh, ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew is a VSO language. So this is, um, this is a bit interesting. All right, so we see our coordinated conjunction, we see our definite article A, and we see our masculine singular noun. So, it was. 
here's our G stem or call, third masculine singular suffix conjugation preterite, it was. So um, however you choose to translate nachash, you know, I'm going to leave that up to you guys. All right. So, but this is an emphatic noun, a masculine singular emphatic noun. All right. And please notice that it is not spelled sin tata nun, sofit. All right. It is nun ha shin. So, and the nachash, it was arum, so sagacious. All right, its intellectual aptitude surpassed. Okay, mekol hayat So it, it exceeded, it surpassed. Um, it was more sagacious than any living thing of the field and if you can't see the text if it's too small please let me know i'm trying to get as close as i can all right, all right here's our relative pronoun asher which asa our g stem or call third masculine singular suffix conjugation preterite from i ain't seen hey <clears throat> i ain't seen hey all right it made it manufactured and here is Yahweh Elohim, and we've already talked about that. So this is the subject of this verb. This is performing this action. All right. So again, All right. So and the Nachash, okay, it was far more sagacious. All right. It was intellectually clean. It was superior when compared to any other living thing of the field which Yahweh Elohim made or manufactured. All right, continuing. Wayomer el ha'isha. And he said, the hanochash, towards ha'isha, this is our feminine singular emphatic now, the woman. Afkiyamar. Surely it is, I mean, it must be, because Omar Elohim, he said, this is our third masculine singular suffix conjugation preterite from Aleph Mim Reish. He said, who said, Elohim, the pantheon or consortium, all right, or however you want to render this, God, ki amar Elohim lo, okay, particle negation, tochlu, okay, this is our second gender inclusive plural prefix conjugation, okay. Imperfect from Aleph, Kaf, Lamed, meaning um, you shall not, plural, eat. So notice that um, when people try to say that the woman was off doing her thing independently, we see that the plural form is used. And in English, um, it's really difficult to tell um, if it's going to be plural, if it's going to be singular, if it is going to be feminine or masculine. And Hebrew does a fairly decent job of removing ambiguity as it relates to number and gender. So here, because we know, well, we're about to find out. <laughs> so, Vayomer el ha'isha of ki amar Elohim lo ta'akol mikol ezahagan. So, and the Nakash said towards the woman, yeah, it must be, certainly, it's got to be, because Elohim said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. All right, so, um, and we could continue to move on and we know that there's no place where Hasatan is used. Um, conversation continues in four. All right, so, all right, no Satan, all right? We see that, no Satan in Genesis three. All right, now, um, one of our oldest sections would be the book of Job. And um, it is, most people um, would assert that it was probably penned between the 7th and 4th centuries uh, BCE. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what, we want, what we want to do right here is just, um, one, we want to kind of put the satan um, in a position where we can see what it looks like literarily. So, um, 
All right, so here's Hasatan and what it looks like. And then what we should be able to do, we should be able to establish as to whether or not the Hasatan is an adversary of Yah or a subordinate of Yah. All right, is Hasatan the adversary of Yah or is Hasatan a subordinate? Okay. All right, so um, ironically, if we were to look at Job's name, Job, all right, looks a lot like a derivative of the verb to be an adversary or an enemy. All right. All right, so um, we're in chapter one, and we'll just jump over to six. Uh, if you're having a hard time, see it, I guess, put something in the chat or or let the moderator know and she'll pop in here and let me know. Yeah. All right. You can be seen from my end very well. So. Okay. Yo, Fee. Wa ye he, ayo, wa ye ba u, bene ha alohim, le hit ya zeb al yawi, wa ye bo gam hasutan, betu kam. All right. Now, interesting. Let's, let's check this out. Here we go. Wa ye he, ayo. And it was, all right, this is our G stem, third masculine singular, okay, prefix conjugation, preterite from hey, yo, hey, and it was, here's our demonstrative noun based on the presence of this definite article, hey, hayom, and it was on that day. All right, here's our will conjunction, our call third masculine plural prefix conjugation preterite from bait will aleph and they came so and they came and who came bene ha elohim all right so here we have our masculine plural noun and construct sons of we have our definite article hey our masculine or gender inclusive plural noun so this is our uh, masculine plural gender inclusive uh, emphatic noun so bene elohim the sons of the gods all right so and it was on that day and they came the sons of the gods all right all right so to um, station themselves um, on the account of Yahweh. <laughs> I guess we can translate that way. So here's our coordinated conjunction, and here's our third masculine singular call stem prefix preterite from Beit Vo Aleph, and he came also Hasatan. Notice the definite article, evidence of gemination. So we know it's an emphatic noun. All right. Hasatan. Not any satan, but hasatan. Wayabo gam hasatan. And he came also hasatan. Here's our inseparable preposition. Toch meaning in uh, mist. And then we have our pronominal suffix, third masculine, gender inclusive, or masculine plural in the midst of theirs or in their midst. So that's important. So right now we see there's nothing popping off, right? <laughs> All right, so we continue. Wayomer Yahweh el Hasatan. Me entabo wayan Hasatan et Yahweh. Wayomer. Me shoot be erza. O me tahalik bo. All right. And I'll try to get to this really quickly. And he said, who said? So this is our call, prefix, preterite from Aleph Mem Resh, third masculine singular. And he said, who said? Yahweh said, towards, here's our preposition. Here's our masculine singular emphatic noun, the Satan. And Yahweh said, towards the Satan. Now here we have our contracted preposition, men. Uh, we notice there's compensatory lengthening due to the fundamental rejection of the dagashim here. So, mean, so from where, okay, have you come? So here we have evidence of our 
um, prefix preterite. This is a second masculine singular prefix conjugation preter from Beit Ro Aleph. So from where have you come? Layaan, third masculine singular prefix preterite from Mayan Lunhe. And he responded or answered. And who answered? And this is because the language is a VSO language, right? Verb, subject, object. Here's our verb. Here's our subject agreeing with gender and number. And he responded. Who responded? Hasutan responded or answered. Article the accusative. Yahweh, meaning he responded or answered Yahweh directly. Wayomer, and he said, Mishut, here's our contracted form of the preposition men, evidence of gemination or assimilation of the noon. Here, if you can see that, that is the Dagah Shazat to accommodate for the assimilation of the noon. Now, notice that there's a Hirik here, right? And here we had the Tseri, and that is because of. The rejection of the dog is gemination resulting in compensatory lengthening. So here, same thing. It is the contracted preposition men, simulation of the noon. So mishut, here is our um, infinitive class. So from moving about or, you know, going, you know, back and forth, to and fro, in, here's our inseparable preposition, and uh, and in the earth. All right, please notice this vowel here, which lets us know we're talking about an emphatic noun. All right, all right, here's our coordinate conjunction and mahit halik. All right, and we have our, again, rejection of the dog resulting in compensatory lengthening. So our conjunction, here's our preposition. And the infinitive, hit the halik, all right, walking around, moving about, inseparable preposition, third feminine singular suffix, notice the ma peak, but in it. All right, and I can try to move really quickly. Wa yomer Yahweh el hasatan. Hasamta libka al abdi. Iyob. Ki ein kamohu ba'ad ishtom wayashar yere alohim wasar mira. All right, so, and he said Yahweh towards the Satan. Here's our um, accuse, um, excuse me, interrogative hey. Right. Have you placed or set? And he said, Yahweh, towards the Satan, have you set or placed okay, your heart upon my servant? Uh, Abdi, here's your masculine singular noun with a first common singular phenomenal possessive suffix. Here, again, we have our interrogative, hey, this is our second masculine singular suffix conjugation call from sin yod mim sim. So, have you placed or set your heart upon my servant? Yob, this is our proper noun, because there is not, okay, negation, substitute negation, as him or like him in the land. Again, here's our separable preposition bait. Okay, notice the vowel. Let's us know this is an emphatic noun in the land. All right, here is our masculine singular noun and construct. A man of integrity, ishtam, a man of integrity, layashar, and our suffix conjugation, jistam, from yod, shin, resh. He is straight, okay, well, I guess I say upright. A man of integrity, and he is upright or he is straight. Yere Elohim, a fear of God. Here's our G stem and construct, a fear of Elohim. Okay. And here's our participle, and from Thamic Waresh, and he rejects or turns away. He's a turner away okay, from Ra'a, bad, wrongdoing. All right, and again, because the Resh fundamentally rejects the Dagashim 
of gemination, we have to account for was compensatory lengthening. So notice the vowel here with the contracted form of the preposition men. All right, so um, this is what y'all were saying about Yob, and then we have, um, I guess we can just kind of quickly advance this so we can kind of get to the point where we see that he's going to be subordinated by a set of instructions. All right. So, um, wa ya'an hasotun et yawi wa yo omer ha khinam yore yob elohim halo ata sakta ba'adu وبعد بيته وبعد كل شلو مسو بيب معاس يدو برخطة ومخنه براد بغرد So, and the Satan answered, responded, or answered Yahweh, and he said, basically, um f without gratitude <laughs> or, or you know you know for no reason you know um is he a fear is job you know not a fear of elohim so like is it without cause that he is a fear of elohim you know hello here's our uh interrogative hey particle negation hello like uh have not Here's our second masculine singular subject pronoun. Have you not or have not you in here? Um, this is going to be our second masculine singular suffix conjugation preterite. And the critical note would allow uh, us to go down and look at um, some of So have you not um, shielded or put up a shield, okay, on behalf of him? Uh, it's a preposition. Here's our third masculine singular. All right. Suffix. All right. Have you not shielded or erected a shield on his behalf and on behalf of his house and on behalf of all which is to him? So here's all our <clears throat> which. Separable preposition. Lamed. Third masculine singular. Suffix. All which is to him. Okay, you have surrounded, all right, so be, all right, from all which you surrounded, um, his manufactured thing or the work, all right, in concert, the work of his hands, okay, Yadau, all right, feminine noun and construct with a third masculine singular pronominal suffix, all right, the work of his hands, all right. Here's our PL, so you can see that, sorry about that, our PL, second masculine singular suffix conjugation, preterite, okay, you bless, okay, and his, um, his cattle or his belongings, I mean, literally probably his cattle, um, his belongings, everything to him is bursting out, is overrunning in the land. All right, so, Ulam shalachna yedaka wega'am bekol asher lao im lo al penecha yebarachecho vayo omer yawi el hasotan hine kol lao bayodeka rok ilau al tishlach yodeka all right, so quickly here we see that um, we can move and it says perhaps, you know, maybe what we should do, maybe send now, okay, a polite form of a, a command, right? Send now, please, you know, um, send your hand and uh, maybe touch, strike, do a little something, touch him up a little bit. Okay, from this is our first noon verb. All right, and it's a second masculine singular um, imperative, polite imperative from noon gimel line. All right, and then strike touch. Okay, on all or against all, 
which is to him. If not, you know, you know, if not upon his face uh, or upon against your face. Um, and I guess it should be read as curse you. you know? <laughs> All right, so you can look at the critical note. So the implication is, you know, go ahead and send out your hand and touch him up a little bit and everything that belongs to him. And then let's see if you will not surely, you know, curse you to your face. All right. And then we have Wayomer uh, Yahweh. So and Yahweh said towards the Hasatan, behold, all is which to him, right, is in the hand of yours or in your hand only so rock this is what we're going to use to substantiate our position that the satan is a subordinate only towards him allow okay only towards him preposition third masculine singular object suffix towards him okay particle negation out so this is going to be a second masculine singular justice like you shall not don't okay okay send out your hand all right, so only against him, towards him, do not send out your hand. So we see that the instruction came from Yahweh towards the Hasatan. Yahweh And Yahweh said to Hasatan, Hine, behold, all which is to him, Beyodaka is in your hand, Roch only towards him, you shall not send out your hand. And he went out or departed from the presence, all right, literally from with the face of Yahweh. All right, so that right there sets up conditions that Yahweh can issue instruction and those instructions are to be followed, which would put the Hasatan in a position of subordination. Yeah. All right. All right, so Satan was not in the garden. Satan <laughs> is a subordinate, right, amidst the sons of the Elohim, right? Mm -hmm. um, and let me see. And so far, we have not seen any concept of a devil, but I guess we can just roll right over quickly because I, I want to get out. I don't want to hold this too long. But um, in First Chronicles uh, 21 and 1, um, you will see the difference between Hasatan and Satan in the implication. All right, so Satan meaning an adversary, right? So, Wayamud Satan al Israel, Wayaset al Doid, La Minut et Israel. All right, so, and it stood or and it came up, all right, and a, an adversary, all right, upon. Israel. All right, here's our Hifil. So I'm sorry, let me, I just walked right straight through that. This is our woe conjunction. This is our third master of singular call stem prefix preterite from the IMM dollar meaning to stand. So, and it stood. Okay. An adversary. Notice the absence of the definite article. So it's not an emphatic noun. So, all right. So, and it stood an adversary. All right. Or an or an insurrection, insurgency upon Israel, against Israel. Well, you say this is our third masculine singular, Hifil, from Sonic Wotau. Again, third masculine singular prefix, preterite. And it, relating to the insurgency, provoked Dawid, Called the accuser to mean that whatever's to follow be a definite direct object. It provoked a weed. Here's our call, infinitive construct from Mem Nun Hey to count to number. Okay, like a census to be like, all right, we're gonna call up all the troops and figure out who's down and who's not. All right, to number. Here's our article, the accuser. Yisrael. So this was not Hasatan. It's more like an insurgency. And it stood a rebellion or an insurgency, an opposition against Israel. And that opposition, okay, was enough to cause or to incite 
all right, causative to for Dawid to number all of Israel. So that had nothing to do with the Hasatan. It has something to do with an insurgency. Wow. Okay. All right. So um, I think I've run through that as quickly as I possibly can. Um, let me think. Um, we, I believe we were able to address the concept of the devil. So when we went to the Genesis narrative, there was no devil. That was the Hanachash. So there was no presence of the Satan. All right. Oh, I know what else. And the other thing is, can the devil make you do it? Mm, right. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. So let me just quickly touch that. And then because I don't want to drag this thing out too long. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to run right over to um, um, Exodus 20, Shemot 20. Right. All right. Uh, where are you? All right. So can the devil make you do it? Right. So a lot of times people be like, oh, you know, the devil's out to kill, steal and destroy. Um, you know, um, I don't know. The devil made me do it. All right. So if you are a believer of this particular system, um, the text is going to kind of make it difficult for you to say the devil made you do it. All right. And the reason being is here we have we're going to have the deity establishing its preeminence. Right. Saying that. Kind of just saying, hey, in case you don't know, um, this is who I am and what it's going to be and what it's not going to be. So um, you can just kind of follow along. But once we get right here, um, then I'm going to go ahead and break this down. This is not enough time to do all that. All right. So um, one, we see the deity establishing order. So now here we go. Can the devil make you do it? So here's our particle of negation here in verse 5. Here's our second masculine singular prefix conjugation. Okay, from he wo he, so lotis tachawe. So um, in Ugaritic, it would be like um, probably like your T stem, like a causative reflexive. All right, so you shall not cause yourself to bow down. Okay, to them. So lotis tachawe lohem. So you shall not bow yourself down or cause yourself to bow down. Here's your inseparable preposition. Here's your third masculine plural phenomenal suffix to them. All right. All right. And that would be referencing Elohim Acharim. So Anochi Yahweh Elohecha. So Elohi Elocha Elohim. There shall not be. Not shall it be for you to you, Elohim Acharim, additional gods. Okay. And so then, by the time we get down to here, we know, you shall not bow yourself down to them. Here again, our accordion conjunction, particle negation, and not shall you be caused to serve them. So vocalization is everything. So here Ooh. this is our second masculine singular hopeful prefix conjugation imperfect. So just the difference in vocalization carries tremendous semantic implications. So here this is saying you shall not bow yourself down. You shall not be the cause of you bowing yourself down or prostrating yourself to them. Not only that, you shall not be caused to serve them. And here's our third masculine plural pronominal suffix. Wow. Okay. So no one can say the devil made me do it or a spirit jumped on me. No, you did that your dang self because you shall not be caused to serve anything. Just wow. <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's funny because um, when you start to break, when you start to see what is actually saying and and you realize that a lot of the concepts that people promote they push and they make whole lectures uh, out of 
it's just it's not there it's not there and 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 we just saw with our own eyes we saw what it looks like we saw what the time looks like and then we saw what wasn't there and it wasn't there and so this is why hebrew literacy is so important because it's not to say that you know you can't do what you choose to it's just to say you can't lie about it because if it's not there it's not there you know and like the way you just broke that down was just that I, first off, did y'all hear how he read? Did y'all hear how all these brothers read the text? All right, I've heard people read Hebrew before and it sounded like they just got out of hooked on phonics. Okay, I don't even know that you could do that for, for Hebrew, but it, it sounds terrible. All right, the way that they broke this language down, not only just in the grammar, but look how they're, I mean, come on. This is, this is a whole different level and it's so sad that majority of the people out here are not, they don't have this as a standard. This is the minority. This is the outlier in a culture that is that is giving their life to what this book says. And that is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it, it, it is. It's, um, but like I said, I'm going to hold the, the leaders responsible because Indeed. they, because what they're doing, they're creating doctrines that are designed to arrest development. If you say, hey, you know, you can learn this in the afterlife, you can learn this in the kingdom, or it's not necessary because King James was a black man, he was an Israelite, uh, you know, what any number of these asinine excuses. Um, and then you have people, and I'm just going to call people by name, especially if I interacted with them, Zion Lex, mm -hmm. he's, a, he's a professional liar. He said chokhmah is a compound word. It is not a compound word. He said that Bereshit bara Elohim means God. In the beginning, he created God. It does not. It cannot mean that. <laughs> if he knew the grammar, he would never even propose something that was. Uh, he said that chala meant declare. Well, in order for hey, well, hey to be used as declare, that triconsonantal has to be utilized in the PL verb stem, which means it has a whole different set of accompanying thematic vowels. And it don't sound like chala. And if he really knew the language, he would know and never say something so profusely vacuous. You know, and so we could just go on and on and on. Because when you have these superstar, you know, baseball cap, gold chain wearing Hebrew prophets trying to make everything super fly and make everything fit everybody's mold and you know we'll get a little bit of the black woman is god a little bit of you know comedic this a little bit of jewish mysticism and throw some salt and pepper and some you know cloves of garlic and call it a day I and mean, it just doesn't right. work that way because okay. you're playing with people's lives people that are have real problems beyond wanting to be an internet superstar exactly you know? People have substance abuse issues. People have been sexually abused and are trying to figure out how to manage their sexuality or the concept of sexuality in the face of such egregious trauma. Um, you have people that have never known a functional nuclear re relationship. And so then they're coming looking for God to help heal, to help direct. And then you have these charlatans that are preying upon them and are keeping them sick, if not making them more sick. You know, they say they're, they're about women and helping the black woman and all this, but they're keeping them in an arrested state of development by mm -hmm. feeding them copious amounts of bovine fecal material. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And it's just trash all around. All of it is just trash. And people need to stop following people who aren't even uh, competent. And, and, and this is the reason why I, I asked you brothers to come on because I got tired of seeing people lie. I got tired of seeing people pretend like they know Hebrew. I got tired of people pretend like they know this language. They know the, they know this language. It's just, it's annoying. And when you know, when you've been taught and when you're around brothers and sisters who can actually do it, it's just like, my gosh, this is, you know, people, unfortunately, it's almost like you guys have been hidden from the culture in a way. And, and people haven't really been able to see you all really tackle this thing as it should be as what real teachers should be doing to give a quote unquote truth to their people but obviously the truth would not allow them to maintain the lies that uh they promote so you know it's yeah. obvious 
Yeah, we're, 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 they've hidden them. We're not hidden. They've hidden themselves. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, and I get it. You know, you know, I mean, most people don't want to. It's hard to admit you've been a victim of abuse mm-hmm. because then the first thing you want to do is try to figure out, well, how do I negotiate my self blame in the in the as it relates to my victim stance? You know, because at some point, every victim has to face that truth as a victim. What was my stake in this? You know, and sometimes people can't get past blaming themselves for becoming victims. And that's mm-hmm. unfortunate. And a lot of people that get victimized by these pseudo religious conscious types, they don't often recover well. Nope. You know, yeah. so, you know, so it is what it is. So people, if you're if you are a Hebrew and you want to be about that life, you need to be able to manage your book. If mm-hmm. you want to fly aircraft. You have to be certified on the aircraft that you fly. You need to be able to read the manual and know the manual in and out. Right. You just can't throw on a pilot's uniform and say you're going to fly the plane. You're going to kill everybody. That's true. That's absolutely true. And um, does anybody else want to say or add anything? Any other other panelists? Feel free right Yo, now. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. This is Yoke and I. All right. So uh, my brother Dwight. Every, first and foremost, um, I want to give all the brothers. You know, um, if my hands weren't full, I would give you um, uh, an applause. Um, this is absolutely an awesome show. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely was fun to be on. I really don't like being on um, video and recorded and whatnot much, but um, you are abs- This was absolutely amazing, um, and, and you are amazing as a host. Thank you. Uh, the way you did it, it was very professional. Um, and you actually gave us an opportunity to speak because oftentimes that doesn't happen. Um, when uh, when we go on as a collective or when we go on individually, we don't actually get an opportunity to speak and be heard. So I really do appreciate that. Um, my brother Dwight, um, he brought up, um, my, I ended up, my signal ended up dropping. So I, I ended up getting on before I could even ask the question that we were already, um, we were already going into MIS. Um, but um, he talked about Lahith MacArthur um, as it relates to Deuteronomy 2868. Um, I'm not going to ask him. I'm going to just put it out there. Um, but if we go into um, Yeshiyahu or um, Isaiah 52.3, um, we see the word Neem Kartham. Um, it's in his Nifal stem. Um, and it's also in his perfect tense. We see, we see something already happening. We're seeing where it says there, you have sold yourselves. Um, so if we're speaking in past tense, this was something that already happened. Whatever they were looking for had already happened. It wasn't something that um, that went on for the transatlantic slave trade or anything like that. Um, far, far be it from that, um, because just like the brother stated, uh, none of us who are descended from um, slaves, um, you know, that left the West Coast of Africa, none of our ancestors sold themselves into slavery. They were and, and they, there was definitely plenty of people buying. Um, plenty of people buying there. They couldn't. They couldn't. Um, they couldn't keep us on the shelves, so to speak. So um, I just wanted to touch that. Um, exactly. But yeah, that was that was it. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to say? If not, you can just. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. There was one more part. I'm juggling a bunch of stuff. There was one more part okay. that I think that I forgot to mention. Um, my portion. Um, it's gonna be really brief. So we didn't um, really touch the construct chain. Um, One second, brother. We can't. You kind of. You sound a little off when, on your audio. Do I sound better now? Mm, it's about the same. All right, crap. Well, don't even worry about it. Um, no, it's okay. You can go ahead. You can go ahead and just go. It's it's fine. Okay. So we, um, in regards to, to Yahweh, um, we actually see that function. Um, we see it repeatedly in the Hebrew Tanakh as Yahweh Elohim. Um, we also see the term Yahweh Zavahot. Um, everyone renders Yahweh Zabaot um, as a construct chain, meaning a, a relation, meaning there's a um, possessive relationship. So Yahweh Zabaot would be um, Yahweh of of um, armies. Um, but then when they say Yahweh Elohim, they don't say Yahweh of Elohim or of the pantheon. They just say Yahweh Elohim. I think they say I, I forget what they render it as. But if one is a construct chain, whereas Yahweh is of the armies. Um, then the other one would have to be a construct chain as well because they're both nouns um, in concession. Dang. So one, one noun after the other. Um, whenever you put nouns in concession, one, two, three, four, whatever, 
it forms a possessive relationship. Um, that possessive relationship is shown by the word of. Um, so it would be Yahweh of um, of the pantheon or Yahweh of gods. Um, so yeah, you, you, you can kind of see this function in, in um, Psalms 82, but that was all I want to say. I don't want to take up too much of anybody's time. I just wanted to share that. Um, but yeah, great job, fellas. Great job, Janelle. Um, hopefully we come back. This was so much fun. We're definitely going to do another show as long as, you know, um, you all don't mind. We'll definitely set this up again, just because I think that um, it's it's really good for people to see the importance of knowing what the text says so that you can live the best way you can according to what you're reading rather than, you know, living a lie because you don't know what it's saying. You're going off of what somebody else told you. And I think that that is a crime in itself, especially when, you know, people base their souls and their deliverance off of the, their salvation, off of the book, you know? Um, so let's see, I just wanna go through a few of the comments. All right, so let's um, talk about Hebrew classes. Um, uh, Miss, if you wanna get on and let people know how they can contact you for classes and I can I can post it in here for you if you wanna give an email or, or something. Um, all right. So, um, if you're so, taking, if you're teaching. Yeah. So, um, I do tutorials, um, on monthly cycles, like 28 day cycles. Um, I require each participant to dedicate no less, meaning a bare minimum of 12 hours of live, uh, instruction to be completed within the 28 day cycle. Uh, basically breaks down to about 1.5 hours per meeting. Uh, three hours a week, um, four weeks out of the month. Um, seems really easy when you talk about it, but you'd be surprised <laughs> for adults how um, how consuming that can be. Um, but anyway, so that's, you know, what I do. Um, within the first 28 days, you will probably cover approximately 15.5 weeks of a semester's worth of information. So it's intense. Um, but you'll learn a lot and within 60 days, um, you should be in a situation where you would thrive in any classical Hebrew class. Right. Um, if you want to holler, reach me. I'm really easy to find on Facebook. Um, I can, um, send you an email or whatever. Um, what is it? M I T Z. Um, I L E L at gmail.com. You can reach me like that as well. Okay, so I'm gonna put it up here. Let me know if this, if I, if I, uh, one second, did I spell it right? Uh, let me see. Uh, I believe, um, is that M I T Z I L E L? Yes, sir. Email, yeah, so that's right. Okay. All right, you guys, so you, please um, contact me so you can get into, so you can learn Hebrew. And um, again, you can put down how, how that goes. Um, if you use this text, you, you know what? Even, even if you talk about the Torah in the Bible in a sense of where you don't agree with it, you still need to be able to, to at least know what you don't agree with. Because I, I see a lot of people oftentimes, because they have a different viewpoint, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, this in the Bible, that in the Bible. And it's like, but you can't read it either. So you can't even really go against it because you can't read it. So, you know, it's just like, um, let's all be competent. At least if you're going to say something, be able to say it and stand on it rather than just regurgitating what you heard just because you see somebody else as an authority. Have the competence yourself to be able to do that. So, um, guys, that's the show. I am so thankful. I just want to again thank everyone for for coming on the show, for bring, for putting your work in, for taking the time to break this down for us, because this is really one for the culture. Um, I know a lot of people may get in their feelings when you talk about Hebrew literacy, and oftentimes it's because they're complacent; they don't want to, they don't want to grow, um, and it just is what it is. However, at the same time, again, this is for the culture. We cannot allow people to be in these streets lying, and. That's just what's going on right now. So just to, again, as the as the, the elder said, to take away a lot of the oppression that's going on too with this book. I mean, it's ridiculous. You gotta get you gotta be able to handle the text yourself. And that's just what it is. So 
uh, with that, I'm going to say let's uh, have closing remarks. Does anybody have anything else they want to say? If not, I'll go ahead and shut this thing down. Um, by the way, you will be able to get a catch a replay. And I'll have the replay available. It'll be on YouTube so you guys can share it. Um, I don't mind you put it, you can put it on your YouTube as well. Just make sure you give credit where it's due and we're all good. <laughs> okay. So nobody else has anything they want to say. Yeah. People be lying in these streets and it's really sad. I fell victim to that as well, you know, in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, no, you're very welcome. And um, I, I really pray this helped everyone. And, um, these brothers do not be out here trying to clout chase. So I, you know, I'm thankful that they even came on because they really just be to themselves and, and, and to, you know, obviously teaching others who, who choose to learn, but you know how that goes. So again, thank everybody. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Please text that number 251 here, 572-9892. And I will put you on the list for the next show and be sure to text you when we have our next show and let you guys know what we'll be talking about with that one too. So I look forward to the next one. And with that, peace family. Peace. Matres años lunes. Matres años lunes. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs>